Now I know. Welcome to your own unlimited learning ecosystem created by Odilo. Everyone learns differently, and today, more than ever, educators need to provide differentiated and adaptive learning. This personalization should speak to a learner's needs, skills, and interests, and intelligent learning solutions have become a must-have for education institutions. To solve the Blooms to Sigma problem, schools and parents must put the learner at the heart of the technology tools that enable one-on-one -on -one learning. Odilo uses data-driven, artificial intelligence-powered solutions to offer a personalized experience and unlimited learning possibilities. This is what we call an unlimited learning ecosystem. Every institution that works with Odilo uses our integrated technology to create unlimited learning opportunities and to provide intelligent Netflix-style experiences that are tailored to the learner and increase engagement. We have demonstrated impact in improving reading and writing habits by three to five times. We offer unified and frictionless access to more than three million multimedia titles, ebooks, videos, audiobooks, courses, podcasts, magazines, textbooks, newspapers, and more. Over 3 million titles from the best publishers all around the world, so you have all ebooks and learning resources you need in one place. And thanks to our flexible lending models, families can save up to 90% on buying physical titles with Odilo. Educators can create personalized learning experiences to address individual students' learning gaps by combining the multimedia titles with their own content resources and incorporate assessments at different parts of the learning experience. Odilo gives you the ability to fuse assessments for learning, assessments of learning, and assessments as learning through the learning paths and learning clubs that encourage collaborative and group learning. Our mission is to democratize quality educational content and provide personalized platforms for schools, making sure that every learning journey will become unique with a frictionless user experience. We are trusted by more than 146 million users in more than 40 countries around the world. More than 6,000 institutions already have their own unlimited learning ecosystem. What about you?
University Press Library is a digital library of ebooks for University Press. There are three things that separate UPL from other aggregators partnership, completeness, and individuality. Well, our first consideration is always quality of content. Um, these are top university presses, Harvard, Yale, California, Cornell. We buy a lot of this content anyway, so it makes sense to achieve economy of scale by, by using end of year money to purchase uh, ebook collections. The completeness of the collections also appealed to us. The fact that, that so selections available from other vendors and finally, De Gruyter has been wonderful to work with in terms of negotiating prices, oh, yeah. license terms, and meeting our needs.
Ladies and gentlemen, my dear colleagues, good morning. We are now on the second day of our first ASEAN Virtual Regional Conference of Public Librarians or ASEAN VRCPL. Once again, here is your moderator for today, Professor Rhea Rowena Yu Apolinario. Thank you so much, Chad. Hello, magandang umaga. Good morning to all of you. Kumusta po kayo? How are you? I hope you are all able to rest well after our long and productive day yesterday. We are now on our second day of the first ASEAN Virtual Regional Conference of Public Librarians with the theme ASEAN Libraries, Arts and Culture, Inspire, Innovate and Collaborate brought to you by the National Library of the Philippines with the ASEAN Public Libraries Information Network as co host and in collaboration with the Philippine Librarians Association Incorporated, Librarians Association of Malaysia, and the Asia Foundation. This event is sponsored by the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, National Committee on Library and Information Services, and the Tourism and Promotions Board. Welcome once again to all our participants in the Philippines and across the globe. We are also live via the official Facebook page of the ASEAN VRCPL, Philippine Public Libraries, and the National Library of the Philippines, and also live on the National Library of the Philippines YouTube channel. Again, I am your host, Rhea Rowena Yu Apolinario, faculty member at the University of the Philippines School of Library and Information Studies, your moderator and host for today. So before we begin, may I request all our participants to please mute your microphone so as not to disturb the whole program. Also, in preparation for the parallel session this afternoon, Please change your name in Zoom for proper identification using the format breakout room numbers, first name, last name, dash country. For example, you can see it here on my uh, Zoom already. Recording in progress. 333 three, three, because those are the breakout rooms that I want to go into later. Then my name, Rhea Apolinario, dash PH. So uh, later on during the parallel session, you can just go to the breakout rooms that you would like to join in. Okay, so but the number in the Zoom will help our uh, organizing committee to also organize you just in case you had difficulties going into the breakout rooms. Okay, so please, yes, uh, please um, change your Zoom name to this format. Thank you. Okay, so if you have a questions to our speakers, please key them in in the chat box using the format name of the speaker to whom the question is addressed to, dash, then your question. Our organizers will consolidate them all so we, we can ask them later in the open forum. Okay, so likewise, you may also use the raise hand button in Zoom if you want to ask a question and we will acknowledge you. All right, and also this one, I'm sure you'll be ex excited about this. There will be a raffle for participants from sponsors during lunch break. So for you to qualify, you need to fill out the attendance sheet, okay? So watch out for it. And speaking of attendance sheet, please do not forget to fill out the daily attendance sheet. We have one attendance sheet in the morning and one in the afternoon. So I can see that the link to the attendance sheet is already posted in our chat box. So please fill it out. And also we have to answer, you have to answer evaluation forms, two evaluation forms, one from NLP and one from NCCA later, okay, at the end of our session. All right, so... Uh, Yesterday, we had our first plenary session and we had a very meaningful discussion by Ma'am Emma Ray, who talked about the Philippine Librarians Association, and Juan Masli, who talked about APLIN, Ma'am Lucila Raquino, who talked about ALPS, and Dr. Faisal, who talked about Librarians Association of Malaysia. We also received a number of questions from you about collaborative activities between and among librarians in Southeast Asia, and our speakers' thoughts on the mutual recognition agreement. And this morning, we will have our second plenary session on international library partners. I know you are all excited to hear from our esteemed resource speakers. And to begin our day, we are very honored to have 
Christine McKenzie, the president of IFLA or the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. Uh, Christine retired as CEO, CEO of Yara Plenty Regional Library Services, Melbourne, Australia in 2016. After 12 years in that role and following a long career in public libraries. Previously, she was manager of Brisbane City Council Library Service, the largest public library system in Australia. Christine has been very active in IFLA and was president-elect 2017 to 2019 and treasurer from 2015 to 2017. She was a co-founder of INELI Oceania, a program funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that provided leadership training for librarians in Australia, New Zealand, and the South Pacific, and which sponsored the formation of the Pacific Libraries Network in 2018. She has been a member of the Australian government's Public Lending Rights Committee, the Library Board of Victoria's Advisory Committee on Public Libraries, the Victorian government's Ministerial Advisory Council in Public Libraries, the executive of the Public Libraries Victoria Network, and a juror for the Ele uh, Intelligent Communities Forum. She has held a number of roles in ALIA, including president from 2003 to 2004. She was awarded an ALIA Fellowship in 2008 and the Vala Robert D. Williamson Award in 2012. Everyone, let us all welcome the president of IFLA, Christine McKenzie. Hello, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to be part of this first ASEAN Virtual Regional Conference of Public Librarians. I'm sorry I can't be with you in real time because of IFLA commitments. Today, I'm talking to you from Melbourne, Australia, where I live. In Australia, we acknowledge the owners of the land on which we meet. And today, I am on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also acknowledge any Indigenous colleagues who have joined us today. I also acknowledge distinguished guests and speakers who are participating. Congratulations to all involved in the organisation of this conference, especially colleagues at the National Library of the Philippines. I hope that this is the first of many such conferences and I wish all participants the very best. I'm delighted to be talking to public librarians too. I've had a 40 year career working in public libraries and I feel privileged and proud to have managed three exciting and innovative library systems. And I know that there's a lot of scope to create new programs and services in a public library. And the people who use libraries, the community members, really respond to these when they reflect their needs and aspirations. Public libraries really are special places. Objective two of the outline of this conference is to develop partnerships and collaborations with the leading international library organisations to be updated with their advocacies, the librarianship trends, including the available library opportunities worldwide. So, Today I will talk about IFLA and what we're doing to strengthen our regional presence and also highlight some of our advocacy work, especially in relation to the United Nations 2030 Agenda. Let's start with IFLA. IFLA is the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. It is the leading international body representing the interests of library and information services and their users. IFLA is the global voice of libraries. It was founded back in 1927 and is based in The Hague in the Netherlands. IFLA has 1,500 members from 150 countries. These are mainly associations and institutions, and we also have some personal members. We have over 1,200 volunteers who contribute through the professional sections, and they're the lifeblood of IFLA. IFLA has two main roles. Firstly, to advocate for libraries at the highest level, 
such as the United Nations, UNESCO and WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization. Secondly, we are here to support the global library field. Four years ago, IFLA started work on its development roadmap 2017 to 2021. And there's been three stages. So the first was the Global Vision Project. The second, the development of the IFLA strategy 2019 to 2024. And the third, to ensure that we have the right structure in place to achieve the strategy. The purpose of the Global Vision Project was to develop a vision for the global library field going forward. Through workshops, meetings and an online survey, every library worker, wherever they are in the world, was able to participate. It's been the biggest and most comprehensive survey of libraries ever undertaken. Overwhelmingly, the most important key finding from the Global Vision discussion is the discovery that the library field is globally united in its goals. Across regions, library types and length of engagement with libraries, there's a deep commitment to the enduring value and role of libraries. And we have the global vision, a strong and united library field powering literate, informed and participative societies. Once we had our global vision and the 10 highlights and opportunities, together with our members, especially those involved with our professional units, we developed a strategic plan. And this is not just a framework for the actions of IFLA sections and headquarters, but it's also an offer to libraries and library associations everywhere, allowing for greater alignment and effectiveness in support of the field and the people it serves and a stronger global voice. The plan has four strategic directions, and they are, one, strengthen the global voice of libraries. Two, inspire and enhance professional practice. Three, connect and empower the field. And four, optimise our organisation. We've now completed the governance review of IFLA, to ensure that we have the right structure in place to achieve the strategy. We looked at the governing board, professional council and the strategic committees. And as a result of the consultation we did with members and volunteers, one of the main changes is the addition of a regional council. And this mir mirrors the professional council. And it's made up of six regional divisions covering all areas of the world. And the ASEAN area is in the Asia Oceania division. The purpose of the Regional Council is to improve participation and representation in IFLA, and it will also have a strong advocacy role. It will provide direction, guidance, and support for IFLA's advocacy work around the world, notably concerning the Sustainable Development Goals and engagement with the United Nations regional agencies. It will also bring together information about advocacy priorities within each region in order to identify potential global activities and to raise awareness in the regions of IFLA's work. Regional division committees will have members from different countries in each region who can support the development and delivery of action plans that respond to the needs of the library field in the region. So the Asia Oceania Regional Division has 20 members from 16 countries. The regional divisions will contribute to IFLA's overall strategy and work with other relevant committees and groups to increase library advocacy within the region. They will play a vital role in ensuring that IFLA's work responds to the needs of the library field they will do this by providing opportunities for learning and defining these regional action plans. They'll have a strong focus on defining advocacy priorities and also building capacity across the region. In particular, they allow for a stronger voice for regions within IFLA and a stronger presence of IFLA on the ground. 
They will build capacity to advocate at all levels and identify and work on advocacy priorities, cooperating with sections and advisory committees, as well as other organisations. They will also contribute actively to efforts to engage members in the region, building awareness of IFLA's work and reach out to non-members. I hope that you can become involved in the work of the Regional Division. You can find the representatives from your country on the IFLA website. And I'm very happy to say that Alvira Lapuz is the representing the Philippines on the division. And so the opportunities here are to work together to advance the United Nations 2030 agenda and to have a stronger voice globally. Many of you will be aware of the great support that comes from the National Library Board of Singapore, who hosts the regional office, and we want to strengthen and enhance that work. And so I have every confidence in this new structure and its emphasis on how important the voice of all regions of the world are and how we must continue to strengthen the global library field. Now, to move on to talking about advocacy and what IFLA is doing. These are indeed very difficult times we are going through. And while the world can appear to be in crisis as we endure the global pandemic and the increasing impact of climate change, we do have a framework to guide us through to make the world fairer and sustainable. Back in 2015, the 193 member states of the United Nations adopted Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. There are 17 sustainable development goals and 169 targets. The United Nations Secretary General at the time, Ban Ki-moon, said that the global goals represent a universal, transformative and integrated agenda that heralds a historic turning point for our world. The Sustainable Development Goals have become a core part of IFLA's work in terms of our engagement both with external organisations and with the library field. This is an ongoing effort built on the energy, ideas and engagement of thousands of librarians around the world. To support this work, we've developed the Library Map of the World, and the aim of this is to provide national-level library data on selected metrics across all types of libraries in all regions of the world. And the site also highlights stories from different countries that show how libraries are achieving the SDGs. There are over 40 stories from 25 different countries to inspire and motivate and to amplify the actions of individual libraries around the world and how they are working to make the world sustainable. Two of the major crises we are facing are the digital divide and climate change. The pandemic has only highlighted the increasing inequalities and we've seen firsthand the impact on communities around the world where people have really missed being able to visit their local library. They've told us that libraries are so important in their lives for learning and reading as a meeting place and as an antidote to loneliness, as well as for practical things such as access to Wi-Fi and PCs. And the pandemic has really emphasised the digital divide. Well before COVID, the role of libraries in bridging the digital divide was being highlighted, especially in relation to the Sustainable Development Goals. In 2019, the Development and Access to Information report produced by TASHA in conjunction with IFLA was launched and the purpose of the report is to describe how libraries can assist with achieving the SDGs. One of the contributors is Tim Unwin, UNESCO Chair in ICT for Development, who says that technology is increasing inequality. While digital technologies offer vastly increased free knowledge sharing, 44% of the world does not have access to the internet. And without universal access, inequality will increase. And he tells us librarians that just providing access to content isn't enough. We also have to provide access to technology and training for people to be able to access online content. Even here in Australia, a rich country which should be able to provide internet connectivity for all its citizens, there have been stories during the lockdowns of children at home doing their schoolwork using a mobile phone 
because they didn't have a laptop or internet access. Because the pandemic has highlighted serious inequalities in access, an important recent initiative for IFLA is the Library Pledge for Digital Inclusion. This sets out libraries' readiness to promote maximum connectivity, access to content, skills support, and to advocate for public access. Over 500 associations, institutions, and individuals have already signed the pledge. And IFLA has worked with like-minded organisations to develop call to action, libraries in response, every community connected. This calls on governments to support investment in wider connectivity and also investment in the libraries that help users access online information. The document's been presented at the United Nations and Internet Governance Forum events, and its purpose is to gather support and consensus for putting libraries at the heart of efforts to ensure meaningful connectivity and to respond to the pandemic. The other great crisis the world is facing is climate change. And libraries have a role to play in providing access to information to ensure that people can make good decisions. Climate change affects everything, including our cultural and documentary heritage. At IFLA, we are amplifying our efforts by becoming foundation members of the Climate Heritage Network, which was launched in 2019. The Climate Heritage Network is a voluntary mutual support network of arts, culture and heritage organisations committed to aiding their communities in tackling climate change and achieving the ambitions of the Paris Agreement. The Climate Action Network highlights that cultural heritage is a climate action issue and climate action is a cultural heritage issue. There's a wealth of information about the work that IFLA is doing at the global level to advocate for literate, informed and participative societies. And I urge you to have a look and see what you can use in your work to make a difference. My presidential theme is let's work together. I strongly believe we have to work together. We can't have fragmented responses. We need to amplify the voice of libraries. We need to think strategically about partnerships, and work together at all levels, at our workplaces, with other libraries, with different types of libraries, between library associations and with the library industry. We also need to forge partnerships with like-minded organisations and align ourselves with others who have the same goals and values. I'm coming to the end of my two-year term as president of IFLA, and it certainly has been a very strange time for everyone all around the world. We have all been impacted by the pandemic and our lives as they were and as we were expecting them to be have completely changed. It seems very uncertain how long we're going to be affected by COVID and what the future will look like. I know that the situation in the Philippines has, has been and can, continues to be very serious and I do hope that you all stay safe and well. I wish you the best for the remainder of the conference and hope to see you all again somewhere in real life. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Christine. I know that we are navigating in a strange situation and we really would like to thank you for joining us, even on a recorded uh, presentation in this uh, first ASEAN Virtual Regional Conference. And your theme in your IFLA presidency, your motto of let us work together is very appropriate in this time. So thank you once again, Ms. Christine McKenzie. Our uh, next speaker will talk about the Public Library Association or PLA. 
She is a progressive and innovative chief executive officer of internationally recognized, award-winning library. She focused on advancing communities through local partnerships and innovative customer-driven services. She also leads Richland Library in the implementation of a capital plan that includes expansion and renovation of all locations based on a human-centered design approach. She dedicated herself to creating new service models that result in expanded learning opportunities for the community and outstanding work culture for staff. Let us all welcome the president of PLA, Melanie Huggins. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well this morning. I'm so happy to be with you um, and helping you kick off day two of what I know is an exciting conference. Um, I wanna share um, some uh, information about who PLA is and what we do. Um, I think I can maybe share, I can't, I can't share my screen. Can I share my slides? I'm not sure. If I can, it's okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to try it now. Fabulous. Let's see if it works. Okay, can you see that? Fabulous. Okay, so I am um, an ex in my day job when I am not the Public Library Association president. I am the executive director of a public library system in South Carolina in the United States. Uh, we are a library system of a main library in 13 locations, and we are rural, suburban, and urban all rolled into one. So as COVID has changed all of our lives over the last 18 months, um, we have had to really innovate and change rapidly, as I know you all have. And so I hope we can spend some time in the Q&A talking about those solutions because those are really important to me. But to begin with, I want to tell you a little bit about PLA. Pub the Public Library Association is the membership organization. We are one division of the American Library Association. The next speaker is my friend and ALA president, Patty Wong, and she's going to tell you a little bit about how ALA functions and what its priorities are. But the Public Library Association really exists to meet the needs of public library workers across the United States and Canada and globally, we have some members as well, because we know that those folks that are on the front lines are transforming lives in their communities. And we wanna be the organization that our members turn to when they have questions, when they need education and resources. Um, you can join PLA by joining ALA. ALA. It's $166 per year. It's a good value for what you get, but there are a lot of resources that I'm going to show you today that are free and that I hope that after you're done with this, um, your conference, you will take some time to check out the information and, and resources that PLA makes available to its members and to its partners. The PLA, the Public Library Association, has over 8,000 members, and we represent, our members, are, are they are working in libraries that are very small, um, from 15,000 residents or even smaller towns and communities um, to some of our largest cities and metropolitan areas in the community. The average year in the profession of our members is five years. So if you think about it, our members are pretty new to public libraries and we can really provide a great resource for them as they are developing their skills and really learning their craft day to day. These are the five strategic goals that the Public Library Association aspires to help our members with. And the first one is transformation. And it really is about how public libraries 
put themselves in the center of every community. We believe that public libraries can transform communities, and we need to support those frontline workers that are working so hard to do that. Leadership is one of our strategic goals. We do this through continuing education, through really cultivating a community of talented public library professionals where any member can contribute and everyone can grow. We also focus on advocacy, and this is extremely important right now during COVID to remind our officials, our elected officials, our governments, our decision makers, what it is that public libraries do and how they impact the health and wellness of communities. Um, We happen to have right now an opportunity to get federal dollars for public libraries, so it's really important that we let our members know about those opportunities so they can reach out to their lawmakers and let them know that public libraries matter. Equity, diversity, inclusion, and social justice, or EDISJ for short, is extraordinarily important to public library um, association as a division and to its members. And really, we believe that public libraries can build community cohesion. We think it's the public library's job to champion the voices of the marginalized and the oppressed. And that's really where some of this EDISJ work comes into play. And lastly, PLA believes in organizational excellence. We need to function like a high quality, um, top, top of the line organization to set an example for our member libraries. So we are always looking at ways to better streamline our own processes and really deliver for our members. Hi, Miss. Hi, Miss Melanie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is Rhea, the moderator. Ma'am, can we, uh, I think your, your slide is not moving. <laughs> it's okay. On the, first, on the first slide, yes. Okay. <laughs> it's not in why presenter I... mode. Thank you. I don't okay. know why that is. <laughs> Thank you for telling me. Um, Let's see. I think what I'm going to do is see if I can um, stop sharing. How's that? I'm just going to talk to you. I can share the slides later. The only reason you need the slides is because there are some web addresses in there that you may want to look at later on. So we believe in transformation, leadership, advocacy, EDISJ, and certainly organizational excellence. I'm going to share a couple of the initiatives that we're working on right now with you all. And then I would, when we get to the Q&A piece, it'd be a great time to have a conversation about that. So let, let's talk about EDISJ, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Social Justice. Um, we have a couple of programs that are really critical and important to our members. One of them is called Equity Starts With Us. Recording and stops. These, and these are workshops that are for library staff, and we created them for them in order to explore Recording leadership in, progress. in a world where we are incredibly diverse. Um, and what, how does the library function in that? So it's a series of workshops to support um, a cohort of people that learn together about equity, diversity, and social justice issues. Every Child Ready to Read is one of the flagship programs of the Public Library Association. It is a program based in science about how children learn how to read, and it really focuses on family engagement. There are a lot of great resources on the PLA website about Every Child to Read, and a lot of them are free. And there are some really, really, I would encourage you to go check that out because it's one of our longest standing programs. It's had a lot of impact. There's another project that we, uh, the PLA runs called digitallearn.org, and this is a free online tool that you can use, and you can use this with your own patrons and customers. It's self-paced courses for your customers and patrons to help them develop basic digital skills, and that one is called digitallearn.org. And again, that one is free. You do not have to be a PLA member in order to use that site or that resource. And then there's one other one that is really important to the PLA community, and that is Project Outcome. 
Project Outcome is a free online toolkit that helps libraries measure common library programs and common library initiatives so that we can better articulate our value to our stakeholders. So we don't want to just tell people how many people came in our doors or how many computers were used. We want to be able to show the real outcome of our programs. And that's what Project Outcome is about. It's a free online toolkit that anyone can use, whether you're a PLA member or not. Lastly, I will just say that PLA, really like all of you in your own individual situations, um, had to really innovate during COVID. And we really did look for PLA to be the pulse of what was happening in public libraries during this really difficult time. PLA uh, did several things during COVID. They surveyed its members just to find out who was open, who was closed, who was requiring masks. All of those protocols that we were all learning, we were trying to learn them together with PLA's guidance. Um, there is a host of really great information on the ALA and PLA website about COVID, including, and this is one you may be aware of, the Realm, R-E-A-L-M study. This was a study done early on that PLA was a partner in about how COVID was transmitted or if it could be transmitted on materials and how we would handle our own collections during this time. That was really informative for us in the early stages of COVID. And the last thing I will say is that PLA has a robust uh, publications program. So if you're a member of PLA, you can get a magazine six times a year featuring um, the trends and innovations happening in public libraries. But there's always really great resources, again, on the PLA website. Um, there's a blog that you can read for free about what is happening, what's cutting edge in public libraries. And there are some great strategic planning tools on the PLA website that I'd be remiss if I didn't mention. Um, I just want to say that I'm just really glad to be a part of your conference today. Um, I hope that you will think of PLA um, as another thought leader, just like you all are when you have questions or ideas or when you want to find a new way of doing something, please connect with us. We would love to share and learn from you. And one really good way to share and learn together is to come together. And PLA does host a conference every other year. Thankfully, 2020 conference in Nashville, Tennessee happened right before COVID hit in late February, early March of 2020. And our next conference is in March of 2022. And it will be in Portland, Oregon. And we would love to see some of you there in person so we can continue this conversation of how we can work together. Thank you so much for having me. And I look forward to hearing my friend Patty speak next. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melanie. It was uh, nice hearing the programs of PLA, and I'm sure our participants have a lot of questions, especially you have mentioned a lot of good programs of PLA that I think a lot of librarians here or inform information professionals here are excited to attend or collaborate with you. Okay, so we will see you later in our open forum, Melanie. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions <laughs> about PLA. So we'll have you again later. Thanks, Melanie. Okay, our next speaker is the president of the American Library Association. Patricia Patty Wong is the city librarian for the Santa Monica Public Library in service since March 2017. In her 34-year career, she has held positions throughout California, at Yolo County Library, Stockton San Joaquin County Public Library, Oakland Public Library, and Berkeley Public Library, and Oakland Unified School District, and has been a bookseller during her student life. Her work in managing change equity and diversity, youth development, developing joint ventures and collaborations between public libraries and community agencies, and fundraising has been published in a number of journals, conference proceedings, and edited collections. 
Ms. Wong has worked as a school librarian, children's librarian, cataloger, and special librarian as well as her leadership roles in public libraries. She provides continuing education for practitioners at national and regional conferences. Patty has been an active leader within the American Library Association for 35 years. She's a library journal mover and shaker, recipient of the ALA Equality Award in 2012, Faculty of the Year and Woman of the Year in her voting district. In addition to her role as board member for a number of nonprofit institutions, Ms. Wong is also adjunct faculty for the iSchool at San Jose State University, where she has taught hundreds of students since 2004 to serve young people and write grants to benefit local and regional communities and make the world a better place. Let us all welcome Patty Wong. Thank you so much, Dr. Apolonario, and, and welcome. First of all, I just wanted to um, check to make sure if you can see my screen. Um, yes, we can see yeah. your screen, Patty. And I'm going to advance it just one to see if it's moving. Yes, it's working. Okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> and, um, and I wanted to shout out to my, my good friend and colleague, Melanie Huggins. She's a, she's a leader in our field, um, not just within public libraries, but, but throughout our country. So thank you, Melanie, for being a part of, of today's conference. And thank you, Chad and, us and the ASEAN community for inviting me today. It is truly an honor. Um, and, and we have so much to share together. So, um, so thank you and I will proceed. So, you know, Marcus Garvey stated um, that a people without knowledge of their past history, origin and culture is like a tree without roots. Librarians and library workers and uh, across our world um, are people that share access to that knowledge and are culture keepers for our communities. I wanted to share that as, as sort of an outline of, of what's important to me because that is um, exactly one of the reasons why I became a librarian. Um, and I think that many of you actually find um, that sharing your culture, um, sharing information is a critical part of, of our responsibility as information professionals. Um, the American Library Association is definitely um, where I have spent uh, a good part of my volunteerism in a professional way. We're 145 years old this year, um, established in, in 1876. And to be honest, there's one thing I do wanna share with you today, and that is I am the first Asian American president of the American Library Association. Um, and, and so um, I, I bring this to your attention, not only because of the wonderful audience that we have here, but because um, it, it, it shows and demonstrates a need, I think, within all of our communities to think about equity um, as, as part of our commitment to our communities. So um, the American Library Association, as, as Melanie mentioned, um, there are eight divisions and they are, are wonderful in, in um, highlighting um, services and programs and, and in particular um, advocacy for each of the different communities that they represent. So that's school librarians and public librarians, academic librarians, um, uh, trustees and, um, and friends groups. Um, and <laughs> and a host of supporters that actually create um, community within our library, um, um, our library professionals. And that's actually not just professionals, it's, um, it's all of the members of our, of our libraries that actually create that village uh, that support our community. And then we also have round tables. We have 20 of them and they also represent a wide range of, of community um, engagement within um, um, anything from social justice with our social responsibility um, um, roundtable to um, international issues with our international relations roundtable. And we're very happy to be supportive of that in our community together. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring to your attention today though is, is my promise and my um, support for the work that you do um, and, and the community work that we do everywhere we work. 
to bring equity to, to, um, to all of our different regions. Um, the national and international focus, and then also the commitment that we have to shared learning. If there's one thing that we know that this last pandemic year has, has really focused um, our, our particular need to be innovative, to be creative, to be flexible, to think about on our feet, to be adaptive, um, and we've faced challenges that we've never faced before in terms of information sharing, in terms of equity, in terms of distribution of materials, in terms of fake news and eradicating information, um, in terms of keeping up with that information and sharing that um, in a positive way with our community when sometimes we were the only sources of communication um, and reliable information that they had. I'm going to be sharing with you a few examples of how American libraries um, have, have done uh, many of these things. Um, and also an acknowledgement of the good work that you are doing as well. So when we talk about flexibility, one of the things I think that we all need to remember is that no matter where you work um, in this world, uh, when the pandemic hit, our community was hit hard. Our staff were faced with many challenges of how to regroup, but our community was also, they, they relied on us for so many things. And one of the critical things was digital access. Um, equity um, and accessibility to universal broadband was probably one of the key things that the majority of our community in the US um, experienced and lack thereof. And they relied on their public libraries, sometimes academic and school libraries, to be able to provide Wi-Fi, to be able to provide resources um, and equipment for, and as you heard, I think earlier uh, with our esteem, esteemed colleague from, from IFLA, um, uh, Christine McKenzie mentioned that even in the countries that had significant resources, we had children who could not do their work because they did not have um, access to equipment. So what we know to be true is that universal broadband is an international need. Um, and I ask you to become familiar with the colleagues that are doing that ground sweeping work locally in, in your respective countries, because um, that international need for attention around um, broadband is truly a worldwide equity issue. Libraries were known within our community, um, not as first responders, because that is for us, that means police and fire, but as many of the first restorers, the first communities to come back um, from COVID the first to open up their doors, the first to maintain um, uh, communication um, and information um, uh, strands um, and, and to provide um, financial, um, not assistance, but introductions to financial and financial stability kinds of, of, of resources. Within the financial crisis, libraries were the first to actually bring uh, more information about how to restore um, stability to our communities. Um, they were also in, in the US and I know in many other places, the first, whenever there was social unrest in the community, which there was, mu there was many um, examples of that um, in, our, in our communities, libraries were often the first to help communities make sense of them, to be listening um, agents, to be uh, uh, groups that actually had uh, ways of, of engaging the community so that they could um, not only make sense of what was going on, but actually in a practical way, um, be able to contribute to the healing process within our communities. Like many public institutions forced to close their doors, libraries really worked hard to, to ad adapt to this new delivery model. Many of us um, developed curbside where, where communities could just um, could pick up their materials on demand. Um, they were able to print out things because people didn't have access to copiers. Um, they were able to talk to staff about things that um, uh, might have been 
very easy for them before just to pick up the phone, but now they needed um, support from, from other means. Um, many libraries turn to, uh, to turn to one another and turn to their community as resources, as I've said, for Wi-Fi and other services. Um, I did wanna make note of our State of America Libraries special report. We do one every year in 2021. This particular publication really focuses on um, how libraries were able to make that critical difference within the digital divide, um, within uh, creating that, that avenue of access. Um, even though we might have been closed at some point to in-person visits, the libraries really developed a strong sense of accelerated or adopted digital library cards and other kinds of um, e-access. Um, and many of our vendors actually stepped up to the plate and provided a lot of materials uh, without any, um, if, you, if you subscribe to the service, without any, any delays to really accelerate um, people's uh, strong need for information and education. We were also very adaptable and this in particular was very um, important to me um, because as the first Asian American president, um, equity, diversity, and inclusion is very near and dear to my heart. I wanted to give you a couple of examples. Oak Park Public Library created an anti-racism advisory team. Um, and so one of the things that libraries do, and, and a lot of times libraries are thought of as um, maybe sometimes passive institutions, but one of the things that we can create for community um, is uh, information and a sense of belonging and creating community together. Um, Oak Park actually decided to take, when they, they heard loud and clear from their community and from their staff, that they wanted to create positive ways of making sense of what was happening in our country. Um, and so they created an anti-advisor, anti-racism advisory team. Um, many um, cities, many libraries have, have done similar things, um, inviting community and staff to participate in um, general discussions about race um, and equity and what it meant in our home communities. One of the things that I do in California um, where I am um, the proud director of the Santa Monica Public Library uh, based in Southern California, but I am changing roles and I'm now gonna become the city librarian in the city of Santa Clara, which is in Northern California near the San Jose area. Um, uh, but everywhere I go, one of the things that we hope to do is actually create um, systems change, looking at racial equity as at first, and then looking at equity across many different um, diversities. Um, so we, in, in California, we've developed the California Libraries Creating, Cultivating Race, Inclusion, Educate, Equity and Inclusion, which is an LSTA grant through our California State Library. 25 libraries are working together on creating racial equity plans and statements that reflect that systems change. So, so that we're looking at policies and procedures, we're looking at programming and services, and the hope is that we look at those, um, what we might consider standard services through an equity lens to see if there are any barriers to access, to see if we actually have created um, uh, programs um, without looking at equity as a basis um, and to, to, to do a, an, a policy audit and to do checks on all of our systems so that we can create um, equity from the inside out. The feeling is that um, if we're able to actually uh, focus on our internal organizational strength and examine all of our um, support systems through equity, we'll be able to do a better job in, in supporting our community as well. One of the things that Santa Monica Public Library had done during, um, especially after the murder of George Floyd, um, is we held listening sessions for our community um, who were aching because they were um, um, beyond um, being upset. They were, they were angry. They were um, upset. And they didn't quite know how to channel that into positivity so we could start the healing process. And so we held listening sessions for our community, inviting them to talk openly about uh, what was needed. And then also we had listening sessions for our staff. Um, that has led to coaching and mentoring programs, 
um, and a citywide equity statement that um, we're very proud of in terms of moving, moving us forward as a community. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about that is, is easy, I think, for, for all of our community to do is to think about how COVID has really changed the way that we approach work. Um, both Palos Verdes Library District and um, the Grems Doolittle um, Library and Archives took the opportunity to collect stories from customers about how they handled COVID, how they lived through it, how they emerged um, successfully through it, um, the pain and suffering that they, that they shared within their community. And they started collecting those stories because one of the things that's critical um, that we do so well as libraries is actually to, to highlight and showcase the history of our communities. And so I encourage you, if you haven't thought about it already, to start collecting community stories of, of how COVID has impacted your local community. Um, what, uh, what both Palos Verdes and Grimm's Doolittle um, found out quickly is that some of their um, most um, respected and, and um, uh, requested materials were on those personal narratives that actually happened in World War II and in other um, series of, of where there's been stressors in the community. Those create um, the, the ability for libraries to actually create and, and, and generate history and, and, and to collect that and make it meaningful for your community is, is really something very positive. Um, one of the things we know to be true is that many libraries actually spend a lot of time um, unpacking what COVID meant to people, where they could find resources, how they could get vaccinated, um, what the vaccines meant for people, and, and the changing nature of COVID as we know it even today. Um, Austin, Texas Public Library is a good example of that. And then I did want to bring about a couple of things that um, a lot of libraries did um, because there were so many children and young people and um, everyone at home who needed something active to do. And so many libraries like Fresno County, like Manatee County actually spent many times working on their YouTube channels, um, working on their websites to bring about several things um, to engage their community um, in many different ways. I wanted to encourage you also to become uh, members of ALA. You can connect with like-minded professionals. I invite you, um, I'm gonna leave my, my personal and professional email in the chat. I hope that we will continue um, to connect. Um, it's very important for me, I think, to, uh, to be with like-minded individuals, to, but to also to deepen the work within the profession. We have so much to learn from each other. We can build leadership skills and, and there's a stronger support system that we have throughout the world. Um, and more importantly, we can always contribute to the ongoing professional and um, positive development of our library systems. So um, this is my, my commitment to ALA, but it's also my commitment to you as a colleague and as someone in the, in the community to help us grow through this time of change, um, to, to grow our membership and resources, to amplify our vo a voice in defense of the freedom to read, to fight for increased funding for libraries and policies that strengthen access and to become a more sustainable and resilient organization. I thank you so much for the time today. Um, that's a little bit of my social media um, and references, of course. And I, I thank you so much for the honor of being with you today. And I look forward to your questions. I did want to also invite you. We have 57,000 members strong. We could always, uh, we, we, we would love to have you part, be a part of our membership, but we would also love to have you come um, to meet uh, with us um, um, and, the um, Live Learn X is in Jan 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 excuse me, January of 2022 um, in San Antonio, um, Texas. And, the, um, and in June of 2022, our annual conference, ALA conference is in Washington, DC. And I did wanna make a plug in for PLA. Um, PLA in Portland will, will be one of the best conferences ever. If you, if you can attend that one, I think you will have a marvelous um, time. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Patty.
Yeah, we truly learned a lot from you, and I cannot agree more that during this time, it's important for us to collaborate and work together. And we're happy that ALA and PLA are very much uh, are doing a lot of things during this time. And um, we'll see you again later, Patty, for the open forum. I'm sure a lot of our participants have questions to you and Melanie as well. <laughs> Okay, so once again, thank you so much, Patty, and it is truly an honor to have you, the first Asian American president of ELA. Congratulations also. All right, and for our last speaker in this second plenary session, we have the Deputy Country Representative of the Asia Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Ethan Geary. Good morning to everyone uh, from Manila. Uh, sound check okay, video okay? Yes. Great, okay. Great. Thank, you. Uh, thank you very much. So, um, good morning. Uh, I will share my, my slides by screen. And if there is uh, any technical difficulty, I know that you also have a, a copy of my slides. Um, so, uh, without further ado, uh, good morning. Uh, so, it's, it's my great honor to be with you today. Uh, I'm happy to join you in this historic first ASEAN virtual conference of public librarians. Uh, my name is Ethan Geary. I'm the deputy country representative of the Asia Foundation here in the Philippines. I've also lived and worked around ASEAN and other countries as well, uh, all of them except for, for Myanmar, I believe. So, so I, I get it. Um, <clears throat> uh, first, I'm just going to give you a bit of brief information about the, about the Asia Foundation, uh, which is a nonprofit international development organization committed to improving lives across a dynamic and developing Asia. Informed by six decades of experience and deep local expertise, our work across the region addresses five overarching goals, strengthen governance, empower women, expand economic opportunity, increase environmental resilience, and promote international cooperation. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to share with you some brief information about the Asia Foundation, what we do, uh, how we work, and the ways that we are able to support books, libraries, reading, literacy, and education. Uh, so specifically, uh, I'm going to talk about our presence in Asia, and specifically in the Philippines, our Books for Asia program, which is a long-standing book donation program that we've had, I believe, since the 1950s. Uh, our new program, Let's Read, which is an innovative digital uh, book creation and, and book reading uh, application for, for early grade learning. Our partnerships and overall impact uh, with libraries, with the education sector, uh, and in the sort of the culture of literacy, and then also how some of our larger projects work, um, for example, with government funding uh, and sort of building things to scale uh, and, and building upwards in, into larger projects. We're headquartered in San Francisco, California. Uh, we've, we've been working in Asia since 1954 through a network of offices in 18 Asian countries and in Washington, D.C., Working with public and private partners, we receive funding from a diverse group of bilateral and multilateral development agencies, foundations, corporations, and individuals. In 2020, we provided 79 million in direct program support, and distributed textbooks and other educational materials valued at 5 million. We work on, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, many of the critical issues in Asia. So rapid urbanization, rising inequality, pervasive subnational conflict, violence against women, and a closing space for civil society. We are nonpartisan. We make global impact through cost-effective grant-making processes and direct program operations in our 18 country offices. We work with a political economy approach, meaning that we, we, we work within, um, we, we, we do careful analysis of, of, of domestic politics in the countries in which we work to ensure that what we're doing makes sense, is feasible, uh, and works with local actors. And we partner with a very diverse group. Um, so we are, you know, across pretty much everyone who works in these areas. Uh, as you can see, first, our mission and now our values. Uh, we are deeply ingrained in, in these environments. And as you can see from this slide, we have offices all over Asia, uh, some in more difficult places these days as well. Uh, our work remains very relevant. Uh, so we, we have been in Asia for a long time. Uh, we are an de uh, international development organization. Uh, but our basic feeling is that 
these program areas can continue to be relevant. We continue to update them to work in the most relevant way possible. And so what we're, we are proud that our support to these themes, to strengthening governance, empowering women, expanding economic opportunity, increasing environmental resilience, and promoting international cooperation, uh, those, those are nuanced to the country context in, in which we find ourselves. Um, and we're, we're very confident in that model. Okay, uh, to the Philippines, and I'll just be brief here and get to the, the actual programmatic stuff soon. Um, so we've been in the Philippines since 1954. Uh, it's our largest and most dynamic office. Uh, our major program, is, program areas here, excuse me, are education, peace and stability, law and human rights, economic reform and development, and governance. Uh, we're primarily funded by, by uh, Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, so DFAT, uh, and USAID, so United States Agency for International Development, and also the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, and that's the UK. Uh, and they, of course, recently consolidated their, their aid and their trade uh, into that institution. Uh, we have offices across the Philippines with headquarters in Manila, and then uh, Cotabato, Zamboanga, and Davao. Okay. So, uh, and I, I give you all this as background, uh, just for an, an understanding of how uh, an international NGO works in this environment. Uh, and I want to get a little bit closer now to, to what we actually do uh, around these specific core areas. So we have direct programming, we have support to libraries and librarians and other educational institutions. We have our Books for Asia program, which is a long running books donation program. We have Let's Read, which is um, an update on book donation to a more digital platform that people can access freely uh, and on any device. We have larger donor funded education programming and we do a lot of work in developing institutions in the Philippines as well. Uh, as a specific example of some of our partnerships. <clears throat> so uh, TAF and uh, NLP, uh, so the Asia Foundation has and continues to directly support the National Library Association of the Philippines. Um, we do this in a variety of ways, uh, reading activities, community libraries. Uh, we've been partnered with NLP since the 1960s. Uh, currently we have a Let's Read uh, Philippines and NLP partnership. Uh, it strengthens the capacity of many public libraries in the country through access to books, both in print and digital. And it supports core programs of NLP uh, developing literacy throughout the country, basically. Uh, another specific way that we are partnered and support NLP uh, is our 86th National Book Week, which just happened this year. Uh, so we, we jointly put this event on and are very happy to support uh, this event and others in the future. Okay, uh, books for Asia. So we donate a lot of books to Asia. Uh, these are English language books, and so of course they're most relevant, um, or I suppose in the Philippines, for example, there's, there's a larger readership than in some places, but they have a tremendous educational value. And they really span from early grade reading all the way up through university. Uh, so, so there's really a lot here. And these are children's books, these are, um, you name it, we, we've got it. Uh, so these books are donated to the Asia Foundation in the United States, and then they're shipped to Asia. Uh, so a lot of these books teach important skills such as critical thinking, uh, STEM or STEAM, if you include arts or agriculture, uh, health and resilience uh, to COVID-19, among other themes. Uh, we really stress uh, to parents also tips on how to read with their children, uh, working with volunteer communities throughout the Philippines and Asia, um, along with other advocacy around books, the culture of reading, the culture of literacy. Uh, and so we've donated 52 million books uh, in Asia with 15 million of those books uh, just in the Philippines. Okay. Uh, in 2016, so uh, we launched Let's Read. So Let's Read is an initiative that makes high quality digital books available to children anytime and anywhere in mother tongue languages. So these are really targeted at K through three younger, a little bit older. Uh, but the idea here is really to create and get people books in mother tongue languages. In Southeast Asia, this is incredibly important. There's a, you can see just a map of the Philippines on the right, but I should have included one of Indonesia and every other country as well with their many different languages. So in the Philippines, we have more than 100 languages spoken. 
more than that in Indonesia, um, different ethnic groups, different different religious groups, different everything. Um, so you really have a lot going on. Um, and there's a tremendous need for mother tongue education. And combining that with technology has allowed us to reach more people, more remote areas. So sometimes it's much easier for someone to turn on their phone or a tablet than it is to, to go to a library, um, especially during COVID, especially if there isn't a library and it's hard to get books. Um, so so it really does address a core need in the pandemic, uh, and it's something that we're really looking to expand and to partner with other institutions around. Um, and so in five years, uh, we've created, excuse me, 8 million storybooks have been read. Uh, we've created 6,000 stories in 42 national and minority languages, uh, and you can also print these. So you have the digital copies and you can print them as well. Uh, and we've printed 370,000 copies of these. Um, so it's really, it's really a great program. Uh, I, I'm going to spend a little bit of time here talking about it because I think it's something that would be of interest to to those who are are participating in this event. Um, so uh, moving right along. Uh, so let's read overall vision and approach. So it's it's to become you know there are there are different ways that people access learning materials digitally, um, and not all of those are high quality, not all of those are sourced from, from the most relevant places. And so what we're really trying to do is to, ex to expand the program because we think that what we're doing is, is excellent in terms of mother tongue. Uh, so we're trying to reach uh, 1.5 million books on the digital platform and to have uh, 250,000 monthly visitors by 2025. Um, and we're doing this by, by really implementing projects uh, with, with children, with families, with communities, and, and making sure that those themes are as relevant as they can possibly be. So how this actually works, uh, so communities come together in something called a book lab. Uh, so basically, you know, uh, authors, illustrators, creative types, teachers, uh, people from universities, students, editors, literary types, uh, they all come together in these community events. Uh, and they get together for this, for this purpose, you know, to create a book. Uh, and it's done quickly. It's done in one or two days. Uh, and then it's sent for sort of the back end processing quality control and all this, all of this stuff. And then uh, a short time later, you have a, a book that is published, edited, peer reviewed, uh, and on the digital platform. So it's, it's really, uh, it's really a cool way of doing things. Uh, you can also have adaptation events, and the adaptation events work with similar themes that can that can work. You know, so maybe it's um, uh, you know nearby geographically. Maybe there's enough commonality uh, between that that it could also work uh, in another language. And in that case, we would adapt that story and 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 translate it essentially, but adapt it to that context. Um, so the stories themselves, there are you know traditional community stories that might be told by community leaders, elders, their new stories, uh, stories promoting tolerance, stories about the environment, about, you can, you know, put themes in there. Um, anything is there. Uh, and we work ac across a, a variety of areas with these books. Um, but really what, what, what's powerful about these books is that they are developed by the communities themselves. And in that way, they have a real um, cohesive function as well in getting those communities together. As I mentioned earlier, it's, there's an online library uh, and there's an app. It's cheap, it's open source, it's easy, it's free, uh, it's accessible anywhere. Uh, and what we're really trying to do is to develop that culture of reading with families and to get them young, uh, which is we know is, is associated with many other positive outcomes uh, later in life and is why uh, many of us enter this field, of course. Uh, so we're currently in 14 countries uh, with 42 languages. 6,000 digital titles, 370,000 printed titles, and we've trained uh, 5,500 people in, in this process. I'll also add that my, my aunt is a retired librarian in Framingham, Massachusetts, and that she, uh, she also loves this program. Uh, and she's, she's an adult, so, you know, adults can, can do this too. Um, so uh, I just wanted to show you kind of where we're headed with the program and just how it, how it works a little bit. Uh, so we're, we're currently devoting uh, a lot of attention to uh, increasing reader engagement and emotional attachment. Uh, so really reformatting some of our products to do that. Uh, and this is building out that, 
that foundational structure. We are redesigning our interface to make that uh, more fun, more accessible, easier to use for, for all. So we have uh, kind of a more approachable design, more personal connected experience. Uh, there will be book recommendations. I mean, a little bit like Netflix, I guess, you know, you like this, here's something else you can do. Um, and also trying to make this as accessible as possible. Uh, what we've been looking at is how can we make our programming as inclusive as possible? So inclusive for, economic reasons, for disability, uh, for those who don't have access in the same way for whatever reason, uh, whether they're living in rural environments, whether it's uh, connectivity issues, it's financial issues. And so we're looking at how can we, how can we work with our app to make it as inclusive as we possibly can. Some of our partners uh, who we work with in different Asian countries, uh, can see on the screen there, but it's really a wide assortment of uh, partners from, from all over the region. And we continue to add partners and we would encourage you to please get in touch with us if you can. Uh, it's something that, it's, it's a great program uh, and we'd, we'd love to, to have more partnerships and to, to, uh, to get this out there. Uh, so <clears throat> we try to multiply our impact as we're winding up here. Um, we, try to, we try to get things out there as we can. Uh, so just run you through a few of those programs. Uh, so some of our Let's Read programming is really looking at getting kids those skills and the mindset they need to succeed with relation to technology and, and that sort of preparation, you know, down the, down the path, of course, for those jobs that require that innovative thinking. So some of those themes are, are built in. Um, we work with empowering women and girls. Uh, so, you know, gender, social cohesion, um, climate change, leadership, all of these are also done through, through that lens of uh, women's and girls' empowerment. Uh, we work with our conflict team uh, to, and this is uh, the Asia Foundation Bangladesh. Uh, we have, we have a, uh, the Pluralism Project, uh, which creates universal stories that encourage social cohesion among refugees and host communities. Uh, so these stories are grounded in the experience of the Rohingya, of course, and host communities uh, around Cox's Bazaar. Uh, and this is, this is funded also by the Asia Foundation's uh, DEI, so Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Focused Innovation Fund. Uh, in our Cambodia office, we have the National Reading Challenge, which is a two-week high-visibility national campaign challenging families to start the habit of reading together. Uh, we have community and school storytelling series. Uh, and we have various forms of, of community outreach as well. Um, and, and Cambodia has been particularly good with private sector partnerships. So whether those are corporations, whether those are uh, local companies, but um, some, of those, some of those people who can put resources and support uh, behind Let's Read. Uh, another way that this program is adapted is uh, Let's Read Indonesia. So this is women leading the reading movement. Uh, we have 800, uh, more than 800 reading ambassadors uh, yeah. community level, uh, and IVR, interactive voice response, which is something we're very excited about. Um, and this is really just at that community level, you know, having, uh, that reading. So really instilling that culture of reading in, in kids. Uh, Myanmar. Yeah. So we have, uh, the small grants projects. So this is, we, we give very small grants to, uh, to, to groups. Uh, libraries, youth groups, um, social services, schools to host reading activities. And so the idea is that by, by those small investments uh, that those organizations know what works best locally. Um, and so, so to give those small grants out there. Uh, and then finally, uh, in Papua New Guinea, uh, we have launched uh, a number of uh, community-based reading programs, uh, which work uh, really, again, targeted at that, at that community level and just to really build that culture of reading. Um, Finally, uh, I would just like to, so in demonstrating the different ways that the Asia Foundation as an international NGO works, uh, looking at one of our larger projects here in the Philippines, which is advancing basic education in the Philippines. So this is supported by, by USAID uh, and is a partnership with uh, RTI, which is Research Triangle uh, International, uh, which is based in North Carolina, United States. 
also with Florida State, uh, an SIL lead, uh, which works in language uh, and development. Uh, and so this is, this is uh, the U.S. government's primary support to basic education in the Philippines. Uh, and so this is a large project which works with teachers, which works with capacity, which works with uh, the Department of, of Education at both the, the national and the local level. Uh, and really is a big is a big push in many different areas. But one of the things that it does stress is the creation of those mother tongue materials. Uh, and so let's let's read is is a big part of this. Um, not in the classroom so much as those formal instructional materials, but the idea is that, and it's recognized that we need those informal instructional materials, those those reading materials in the mother tongue, uh, which of course, in terms of families reading outside and those things that stick around, you read with your kids. Uh, it's it's really very important. Um, so thank you for your time. Uh, what, what I wanted to do was really to to show some of the different ways that an international organization works with with reading, with literacy, with education. Um, we support libraries and librarians directly in the Philippines. Uh, this is a little bit different in each country, but uh, it is very important to us. It's a partnership that we've had since the 1960s. So, so quite a long time and, and one that we uh, are very proud of and look forward to continuing in the future. Um, and also would I just encourage you to reach out if you are interested in partnering on any of these activities uh, around Let's Read in particular. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Ethan. Thank you for sharing with us the activities of the Asia Foundation. You've done a lot. Okay, so um, thank you also to all our wonderful plenary speakers. And before we have our open forum, may I remind once again our participants to key in your questions in the chat box and comment section using the format name of the speaker, then question. The questions will be consolidated by the other members of the organizing committee to facilitate easier retrieval of queries during the open forum later. Likewise, you may also use the raise hand functionality of Zoom and you shall be acknowledged in proper order. Okay, so before our open forum, we will have a presentation from one of our gold sponsors, CE Logic Incorporated. So let's watch their video. Um, to our tech team, there is no sound. I evolved and innovative digital resources, research and library solutions, and information analytics designed to modernize and upgrade the academic and professional libraries and research institutions in the Philippines. From over a decade of service, CE Logic Incorporated has catered to more than 300 academic and private institutions in the Philippines that specialize on research, medicine, arts and literature, library management, among others. With partnership to more than 50 major publishers, CE Logic provides different library solutions for academic and private institutions, such as library automation, online library resources, research solutions, and the likes. C Logic prides itself in committing to its core values, making its brand, products, and services stand out from its competitors. For further inquiries, contact us today at customer service at ce logic.com or 8929 5088 local 317. Visit our website at www.ce logic.com. Okay, thank you so much again to CE Logic, our gold sponsor. Now may I request all our plenary speakers to please turn on your video so we can have the open forum. So we have Melanie, Patty, and Ethan. Yes, so uh, Ms. Christine McKenzie cannot join us today. But if you have questions to Christine, we will just send your questions to her. Okay, so we have Ethan here and Patty. We're waiting for, okay, well, waiting for Melanie. Oh, there's Melanie. Hi. Hi, Melanie. Okay, so uh, we've received a number of questions, but due to time, I'll be just reading a few questions, probably the top three questions asked by our participants. So the first question is actually asked 
also yesterday to our speakers. I think this is a growing concern to the librarians in the Philippines and also in Southeast Asia. Um, how does your organization or your association address the mental or emotional well-being of your members during this time? Okay, so that's the first question. Okay, maybe uh, Melanie can answer first. Sure. Um, I I so appreciate that question. Um, mm. We have been through a lot the last 18 months, both uh, locally here, you know, in my own library system and as a, and as a, and as a profession. And one way that we've done that is um, creating safe spaces for library leaders to talk and be vulnerable and to share what they're going through. So PLA has held several webinars where we can just get on and, and chat with each other. Um, what I'm finding locally that my staff needs is clarity. Um, in times of crisis, I think it's really important for leaders to provide as much clarity as possible. It's okay when you don't know what's going to happen next, but I know in my own library system, we uh, have been doing what we call sprints instead of planning for long periods of time we will plan for a six month period and just set goals for that six month period and just get to that finish line and then start a new one. And I can tell you that is done so much for people's mental health and wellness, just knowing that um, we're all in it together and we're just taking it day by day, one month at a time, six months at a time. So providing clarity has really helped, but just providing a place where leaders can get together and have a safe place to ask questions has been really critical, I think, during this time. Thank you so much, Melanie. I, I, I like that uh, activity that you plan in, instead of planning long term. So you plan short term and there should be clarity of goals, clarity of vision that should be cascaded to all the members and uh, that's easier to digest. No, and I'm happy that that really works for you. Maybe we can do that as well here in the Philippines. Um, how about Patty? Uh, yes, Patty, the question is, same question. How do you address the mental and emotional well-being of your members? Well, I'm going to actually put in the chat, I hope, the ALA APA website, okay. which actually um, is about wellness. Um, so we've collected resources for wellness. So our job at ALA is actually um, to be the resource for li libraries and librarians in terms of, um, you know, resources that they can they can focus on. One of the things that we are doing um, in California, anyway, is every two weeks we host a web, um, an, actually an open discussion with all of our directors, and then we have a second one for frontline staff. And it's just open invitation. People do sign up because it's, it's through a Zoom session, so we have to protect um, the support, the staff. But um, but it that connectivity, the collegiality, I think the group process is very helpful to people. Um, sometimes um, a a wellness or a mental health professional also comes on, um, you know, and they've donated their time just to to hear and to listen to people. Um, but I think the biggest thing is to make sure that the staff feel not only that they have resources, but they also have the um, the protections they need and the policies and support. I'm I'm all for you know Melanie in terms of the um, the suggestions for small uh, plans uh, because if we, we we what we know to be true is that no one could have foreseen that we would have a pandemic that has lasted. 18 months and it's going to continue because there's different variants, right? And um, so I think what we have to do is is um, is really adjust um, to our staff to listen to them, um, to take, uh, uh, there are also an interest, there's an also an interesting conundrum in that um, some of our staff are refusing to be vaccinated. So the other thing is to have a balanced conversation about what that looks like. Um, and to, to recognize that we have a series of both individuals um, and also institutional um, learning. So, but I'm going to put it in the chat in just a second. Yeah, thank you so much, Patty. So that's open discussion. How often do you do this with your members? 
like you mentioned, Patty, about open discussion. Is this like a oh, monthly or a weekly activity that you do? Actually, for the directors, it's every two weeks. For oh. you know, for the frontline staff, it's every month. And I will tell you, it's made it's made a huge difference. Staff feel heard, no matter where, what you know, what part of the state they're in. Mm-hmm. It, it makes a big difference. Yeah, it, it's really important that you have someone to talk to or to you know, just mention your concerns or clarify questions regarding work and so many other things. So those are great ideas, Patty. Thank you. How about you, Ethan, and the foundation? Sure. Um- you know, everyone has a different reality with this, right? Um, yeah. In the Philippines, we've had one of the harsher lockdowns, I believe the harshest in the world, um, both in terms of duration and the loss of going outside time. <laughs> um, so, you know, for us, we're, you know, it's basically been 18 months with, with um, a couple couple punctuations in the, in the middle there where, and then kids still under 18 or over 65 technically are not allowed outside the house, at least in the NCR region, right? And we're under lockdown right now. So <clears throat> there are the immediate needs of, of our staff's uh, mental health, of course, and overall well-being. Um, and then just kind of balancing that also with, with the idea that this is a slog, you know, we're, vaccination rates, um, government policy, we're not going to get out of this for at least another year. Um, so, you know, we, we have to really just, as we have all done and just adjust to that reality. Um, and from a management perspective, just try to be very attuned to how staff are doing, how partners are doing, and just making sure that you're as responsive as you, as you possibly can in terms of, you know, giving people as much as you, as you can to help them get through it, you know, whether that's just checking in, um, you know, just, just kind of a basic level of humanity, or if it's the actual sort of operational stuff, you know, making, making sure that people have a, um, uh, a good headset or, you know, yesterday people had requested gaming chairs uh, because they're a bit more comfortable. <laughs> I didn't even know what one was. Um, but, you know, I, I just say there's a, a strong degree of humanity required um, and that recognizing that it's not short term and that we're not, we're not moving out of this anytime soon, essentially. So, it's just really how how can we run the marathon, so to speak, you know? Yeah, that's right. Oh, I like those gaming chairs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if that would help our work, why not? Okay, <laughs> so um, this one, um, questions are coming in, but I think most of the questions will be emailed to all of you because we don't have time. But I still have time for this one question. Okay, again, this is for all of you. Um, do you believe that librarians are catalysts of social change? Especially for Patty and Melanie, you mentioned about EDIS trade programs. No? So if yes, how do you think are the librarians are being social changers? Okay. So again, the question is, do you believe that librarians are catalysts of social change? And if yes, how are they being catalysts of social change? So let's begin again with Melanie. Yes. Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. I believe that. I believe we always have been. Mm -hmm. I think that the way we do it now is a little bit more out front than maybe we've done it in the past. Um, And I say that because I think the way we were catalysts for social change before is by protecting people's rights to information and freedom to read. And, And that is, you know, Patty has already mentioned that that is something we absolutely still stand for. However, we know that people consume information and learn, um, as Ethan was talking about, you know, in all different ways and modalities. And so part of what we have to do today um, as to be catalyst for social change is share that information in ways that aren't just by reading. Um, I know that my library um, after the death of George Floyd, Floyd um, we actually uh, commissioned two giant pieces of artwork that are 20 by 40 feet that represent the Black Lives Matter movement and have them hanging on the side of our library. And um, there are ways that we can say what we stand for and remind, especially the marginalized and oppressed, that we are here to support them and that we represent their voices too. And so I would say absolutely 100% we are. And I think we're doing it in ways that are more out front than we have in the past. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Melanie. Yes, Patty? So and I agree totally with Melanie. I think part of our role as not only information professionals, but as um, 
purveyors of the needs of the community is to provide fora and opportunities for the community um, to make sense of what's happening in our in our world um, and to to be part of that positive change. A lot of our community members actually don't know how to start or where to begin. Um, that's part of the role that I see uh, personally and professionally when I work with libraries in the US and now sometimes in other countries too, to advocate for um, ways in which um, library teams can make a difference. Um, and we're talking about staff at all levels in the organization. Um, everyone, uh, I encourage everyone to think that um, leadership begins at home and um, we have the responsibility uh, to create a stronger community through libraries. Um, some t it, a lot of it is information, but the other part of, of is how do we activate um, that information and provide uh, opportunities for dialogue and stronger understanding so we can create the change that we'd like to see. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Patty. Uh, maybe Ethan, I know even if you're not the librarian, you have thoughts about it? I am in spirit. Uh, <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> and you have a relative who's a librarian. My, my, my aunt yeah. Kelly. She's <laughs> aunt. Um, I, you know, I think that libraries are critical as a um, as community engagement points, community meeting points, um, whether that's physical or digital, you know, the last year has shown us that people need interaction and people need places to go. And, and a library is one of those places and, and um, depending on where you live and how it works, but, you know, in the United States, uh, you know, maybe in the UK, you go to a pub or in, you know, Norway, you go to the sauna, but in the United States, you go to the library or the coffee shop, you know, um, and that's one of your real community points. Uh, and of course, in the Philippines, libraries are, are really crucial. Um, and it's been a real loss uh, for communities this last year that they can't go and collectively learn and, and sit down with a book, you know. Um, so I think it's also a really a, a good kind of inflection point for libraries and librarians to think about, okay, given this big digital everything, you know, how do we really continue to play that crucial function of, of a meeting point and an engagement point, you know. Um, but yeah, it's absolutely critical, absolutely critical. Um, and it's, it's about communities, you know, um, whether that's in North America or Asia, you know. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ethan. So some of our uh, participants are commenting, I like that the library is a critical community point. <laughs> so there. Uh, so um, I'm sorry we don't have enough time for the questions, but we will be emailing you the questions of our participants so you can answer them. And our organizing committee will uh, will gather them all and probably include it in the directory. Okay, so thank you once again to all our plenary speakers. And at this point, we would like to award our certificate of appreciation to all of you. The certificate reads the National Library of the Philippines in partnership with ASEAN Public Libraries and Information Network and in collaboration with the Philippine Librarians Association Incorporated, Librarians Association of Malaysia and the Asia Foundation present this certificate of appreciation to Christine McKenzie, Melanie Huggins, Patricia Wong, and Ethan Geary for being our resource speakers in the first ASEAN Virtual Regional Conference of Public Librarians with the theme, ASEAN Libraries, Arts and Culture, Inspire, Innovate and Collaborate, held on August 23 to 25, 2021, given this uh, 24th day of August, 2021 via Zoom, signed by the Director of the National Library of the Philippines, Cesar Gilbert Adriano, and the President of APLIN, Juan Maslibin Juan Razali. So we are giving you your <laughs> certificates. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of you, Patty, Melanie, and Ethan. It's nice to have you all. Thank you. So all right. Okay. Thank so you. To, thank you. Yes, to all our participants, are you ready for our third plenary session? Again, this is the first 
ASEAN Virtual Regional Conference of Public Librarians with the theme, ASEAN Libraries, Arts and Culture, Inspire, Innovate, and Collaborate, brought to you by the National Library of the Philippines with the ASEAN Public Libraries Information Network as co-host and in collaboration with the Philippine Librarians Association Incorporated, Librarians Association of Malaysia, and the Asia Foundation. This event is sponsored by the National Commission for the Culture and the Arts, National Committee on Library and Information Services, and the Tourism and Promotions Board. Again, we are live via the official Facebook page of the ASEAN VRCPL, Philippine Public Libraries and the National Library of the Philippines, and also live at the National Library of the Philippines YouTube channel. Okay, so again, just a reminder, may I request all our participants to please mute your microphone so as not to disturb the whole program. If you have questions to our speakers, uh, like before, please key them in in the chat box using the format name of the speaker to whom the question is addressed to dash then your questions. Our organizers will consolidate them all so we can ask them later in the open forum. Okay, so likewise, you can also raise your hand using the Zoom button, raise hand if you want to ask question, and we will acknowledge you. Also, please do not forget to fill out the daily attendance sheet. So we have one attendance sheet in the morning and one in the afternoon. And we also have two evaluation forms, one from NLP and one from NCCA that you have to answer at the end of our session. There will also be a raffle for participants from sponsors during lunch break. So for you to qualify, you need to fill out the attendance sheet. Okay, so watch out for it. Okay, so let us proceed to our plenary session three with the theme, Vulnerable Communities, Community Resilience and Social Capital, Challenges and Opportunities for ASEAN Public Libraries. Our speakers are Andres Varheim and Randolph Mariano from the Arctic University of Norway. Dr. Andreas Farheim is a professor of library and information science at the UIT, the Arctic University of Norway. His research interests include information policy, public library policy, community resilience, social capital, welfare state institutions, immigration, historical institutional theory, and political economy. He currently spearheads the libraries, archives, and museums in the community research group at the UIT, the Arctic University of Norway, that focuses on how public libraries, archives, museums, Sami, and other indigenous and minority community documentation centers develop an implement new community-oriented strategies, priorities, models of cooperation, working methods, and community activities. Lamcom Research Group has been a core partner of the international research project called the ALM Field Digitization and the Public Sphere, funded by the Research Council of Norway and supported by various libraries and university partners from Denmark, Germany, Finland, Hungary, Sweden, Switzerland, and the United States. Randolph Marianne, on the other hand, is a PhD student of the Media and Documentation Science Program at the UIT, the Arctic University of Norway. His research interests include cultural diplomacy and soft power, and innovation diplomacy toward libraries, archives, and museums, LAMS learning environments, in providing educational, economic, and social opportunities to the civic public. He is currently a member of the libraries, archives, and museums, and the community research group under the supervision of Dr. Andreas Farheim. Prior to starting his PhD, he worked as a digital engagement librarian at various public diplomacy and cultural centers, diplomatic missions and embassies, including the U.S. Department of State and Republic of Korea's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He studied both his bachelor's and master's degree in library and information science at the University of the Philippines School of Library and Information Studies. Everyone, let's have Dr. Andreas Varheim and Randolph Mariano. Hello, good morning, everyone. Yeah, dear friends and librarians. Uh, by the way, do you see my shared screen? Uh, we can't see it yet, Dr. Varheim. Uh, I've tried to... Uh, let's see here.
Yeah, it should be there. But I'll go on. Yeah, we can see uh, it now. Great. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, Randolph uh, to present uh, research on community resilience and public library development. The ongoing pandemic shows the strengths and possibilities for resilience thinking in public library development. And we are very much honored uh, by the invitation to the first ASEAN Virtual Regional Conference of Public Librarians. My research on libraries has mostly been on the social role of public libraries, how they contribute to create social capital, social cohesion in the community. And um, the time frame for this talk is short, and I encourage you to read the paper and the references for more information and hopefully knowledge. Here you can see the main themes of this talk. Wherever there are people, there are communities. Wherever there are communities, there are public libraries. Or nearly every community. This simple observation tells us that libraries are deeply interconnected with communities. The purpose of this presentation and paper is to present findings from several case studies concerning community resilience at public libraries and illustrate and discuss how ASEAN public libraries can utilize the concepts of community resilience and social capital to address community vulner vulnerabilities. Existing studies, unfortunately, are very few and mostly of American origin and about US libraries and US communities. Uh, I believe that libraries can be understood as community centers filled with, filled with activities responding to changing community needs and individual needs. This is illustrated in the slide showing the mission statement and vision of Denver Public Library, Colorado. The Denver Public Library vision is a strong community where everyone thrives, and I believe with uh, with their any of their activities. Uh, traditional notions of public libraries as repositories for documents have been complemented by the understanding of public libraries as frontrunners in community leadership, organizing activities with partner institutions and organizations. Public libraries are meant to be for everyone. They are universal local community institutions. Every citizen is eligible as a user. It does not matter if people are rich or poor, black or white, male or female, or different from most people in almost any capacity. Moreover, people view and feel libraries as one of the safest places to be. Maybe it is because of this set of institutional values that libraries are, as reported in several studies, consistently one of the most trusted public institutions. That is, libraries are ideal for building individual and community resilience capacity, capacities. From the research literature and government documents, we learned that uh, libraries needs to be attentive and active to be relevant in communities. They also they have been described, described as community anchor institutions and even community catalysts and are challenged to transform how they collaborate with their communities. Communities face um, vulnerabilities 
increasing environmental, demographic, economic, technolog technological, social, and political change, and many other kinds of things that happened. Uh, among this, um, we have, of course, the natural and man-made disasters, like earthquakes, for instance, and the present um, pandemic. But you also have big, slow-moving change pro processing going on over time, like uh, climate change, we have uh, migration, we have the, the huge problem of aging populations, on, not only in, in um, Europe, but, but also now, I believe, uh, in the coming years in China even. And we have um, disrupting technologies that we need to adapt to. And we have uh, the present uh, global instability. How to prepare, how to meet the variety of external threats. Communities need to be resilient. They need to bounce back and handle shocks and threats. And that's uh, not a small thing. Several resilience strategies are needed. Um, we had the concept of, uh, of uh, community resilience. We have the concept of um, information resilience. And we also have uh, cultural resilience. And uh, information resilience is uh, very much connected to uh, in libraries, for instance, information literacy, cultural resilience is, is connected to uh, local community cultural life and cooperation. The study of community resilience and natural disasters is a vast research field on its own. For the study of the role of public libraries in disaster preparedness, the situation is quite different. Extensive searching of uh, bibliographic databases in 2017 and the situation hasn't changed much. Found only one study that employed community resilience as a theoretical perspective. This lack of research goes for the study of information and cultural resilience uh, as well. Much more re research is needed to repeat myself. In short, resilience involves a capacity for successful adaptation in the face of disturbance, stress, or diversity. In addition to the direct participation and an adaptive role in disasters, Libraries can be seen as instruments for contributing to general resilience, the capacity for dealing with community vulnerabilities in general. We also have, we have the specialized or special community resilience that is directed at specific abrupt events, for instance, uh, natural disasters. And this requires, of course, uh, specified adaptive capacities. Some places have more wildfires than avalanches and prepare accordingly, but still unexpected events occur. So on the other hand, we have the generalized resilience or general resilience that has a broad community reach. It, it means um, preparation for, for the unexpected and for change in general, in general. So it is an general adaptive capacity. Um, It is this general ability of general community resilience that constitutes the core of community resilience, I would say. Uh, 
general resilience involves the capacity to handle unanticipated events and uncertainties in general. This way, it is also directed toward the unlikely and unknown threats to communities. And uh, with resilience uh, specialization, some uh, dilemmas comes also. Of course, some specialization towards specific threats uh, are needed, but uh, specialization can be overdone. This this means that uh, reduced cap means that re reduced capacity to meet the unexpected, and this way, specialized resilience can. Uh, actually add uncertainty. Of course, preparation for the obvious is obvious, but might have unexpected effects. Libraries are, after all, one of the few arms of government that really work. No other form of government, however, had the public access computers, the internet access and the dedicated professional to turn information into a vital tool for finding the lost, searching for help, requesting aid, and beginning to recover. These quotes are from uh, research after Hurricane Katrina and other hurricanes that brought disaster to the US coast on the Mexican Gulf in 2004 2005. Uh, we can conclude that libraries play the primary role in disaster recovery in these cases. Libraries also provided basic, basic services as electricity. They had generators that, not at, that at the time few others had, unfortunately, and could help with forms for federal assistance, with applications for federal assistance, which required uh, digital uh, instruments to fill in, digital forms, even in 2004, 2005. And here we see damage um, done to one specific um, library by Hurricane Katrina, and we see the new library building besides. Uh, Will and Bishop found several ways that libraries can help uh, building community resilience. They, they studied uh, US tornadoes of 2011 and 2012 that killed hundreds of people and destroyed the same amount of buildings and probably more. And during this uh, During the disaster recovery period, uh, the libraries provided information access, and the, uh, access to internet and computers. Here, it also was the case that uh, the mobile network was down. One had to rely on landline, landline phones, etc. So the libraries had a huge role, and also the electricity was down. And it was a place for office work and meetings, meetings that was offered by the, by the library. And uh, it was as it, it is often is the, the community living room and meeting place. Uh, we can conclude that the library helped in creating resilience for faster recovery of these um, unfortunate communities. Uh, William Bishop used this model by Norris in the study, and it turned out to be useful, as we can see in the in the previous slide. Uh, William Bishop understands uh, community resilience as a process connected four capacities, 
and foreign adaptation, community competence, economic development, information communication, and social capital. Key drivers of community resilience are social capital, economic capital, and environmental capital. Resilience communities are seen as well-developed regarding these three capitals. That means that people trust each other. They have, uh, they can sustain themselves economically and environmental capital involves the ability and sustainable use of natural resources for human consumption. That is, in plain language, uh, soil, water, and forest. Social capital is uh, defined by Robert Putnam, the American political sci scientist, very well-known American political scientist, as the features of social organization, such as trust, norms, and networks that can improve the efficiency of a society by facilitating coordinated action. I argue, not me, <laughs> I argue that higher levels of social capital, more than such factors as greater economic resources, assistance from the government or outside agencies, and low levels of damage, facilitate recovery and help survivors coordinate for more act active reconstruction. That's a strong statement. Uh, Aldrich studied disasters around the Pacific and found social capital especially important for resilience. This shows the relevance of libraries as community centers and meeting places. Through ordinary library activities, engaging users like through programming and being a welcoming all-purpose community center, can co contribute to social cohesion. And always found that for the most urgent needs, needs in disaster situations, information about them, it is the closest networks, the families, the the closest people around you, the people you know already, that um, are most important. But when it comes to information about outside opportunities and resources, uh, that after a while is, is needed, you need uh, work and you need to apply for, for this and that, and get this and that. It is um, the broader networks the wider social capital, what is called bridging social capital, that increases recovery rates and community resilience. And this also, the social networks also makes people stay and makes people return. People that, that have strong connections in their communities. And um, all this also mentioned social infrastructure for disaster recovery as very important for redeveloping pre existing community networks. This also means uh, the creation of new network. This can be done by cooperative measures like time banking, focus groups, social events, neighborhood groups, etc., and spaces in the neighborhoods controlled by voluntary association, residents, associations, etc., and also planned physical meeting places, including third places, cafes, libraries, community centers. And I'm not making up this 
for you. Aldrich actually mentioned libraries in a 2015 paper. Very few, very few researchers outside the library research do that, I'm afraid. In the fall of, uh, let's see, let me see. In the fall of 2012, with Japanese colleagues, I interviewed personnel from three totally destroyed libraries located in three towns in two prefectures of the Tohoku region of Eastern Japan. This was uh, about 18 months after the tsunami and earthquake. The study describes how library services worked under these conditions. I found that, that uh, library services were provided by bookmobiles and temporary libraries organized by library systems in neighboring towns and prefecture and with assistance from NGOs from all over the world and all over Japan, of course. Library services were quickly offered and served the communities where people were desperate to find information about what was happening, about uh, their missing relatives, uh, finding local government information and public do documents, as well as the news, the local news, and uh, last but not least, to find work. Also, the paper discussed the problematic and drawn out processes of restoration and the building of, of libraries. Uh, here we see um, the temporary building of um, Rikusen Takata, that was one of the cities with uh, a completely destroyed uh, library. Uh, and this um, temporary building was donated by the people of um, Hokkaido, the, the northernmost island of, uh, of Japan. Here's, here we see the library director and her assistant. Um, the fact that we see the library director in this picture at all is a strong statement. Uh, and, and because in Rikus and Takata, all the six library workers were killed. How come she she wasn't killed? As part of the job rotation system in Japan, the director was working in the town hall at the time of the disaster. She had to escape to the roof of the fourth floor building to avoid the water. She must be a really strong person taking up uh, the library directi directorship. What's more in, in, this, uh, in this situation? And here, uh, here on, on the brighter side, here we see the new uh, Rikusen Takata City Library opened in 2017, and uh, that was partly funded by the Singapore government. This study investigates how library programming, program activities contribute to general community resilience by strengthening the connectedness among community inhabitants and their trust in each other. That is social capital. Also, very few studies have delved into this matter because of this one of the authors has made an explorative case studies in several public libraries in the United States Findings from one U.S. library system locate, located in a metropolitan area have been published. The city library system provides nine different types of, of programs and um, the library leadership interviewed in, in this huge uh, uh, library system 
named four programs that they held as the most important. That was uh, finding jobs, adult education in general, English as a second language classes, and pre-K education. In this slide and the two following example of these program types are offered. First, we have early childhood uh, uh, education and time flies. And uh, secondly, there were community conversation programs. And that was a uh, program to promote contact between social and ethnic groups. Uh, and as said repeatedly, it is mainly the daily library activity that create general resilience. It is not the evac evacuation plans. And uh, a third example is um, their homeless engagement program. Uh, the main library branch got a lot fewer uh, visitors and uh, uh, when asked, people said that was because of, uh, of the homeless and therefore the library tried to take better care of the, uh, the homeless and um, it seems that they uh, succeeded. Here we see uh, pictures from the library. Here we see pictures from... Uh, Another U.S. library summer program, Douglas County Library in uh, Colorado. And this is also from the same uh, library. It is the naturalization ceremony for students that pass the test for citizenship after attending library civics classes preparing for, for the text, for the test, sorry. Yeah, and um, I must say that um, uh, this study creates some reason for hope in observing the librarianship and library leadership. The problems of the library study would handle not with despair, but with common sense, knowledge of communities, initiative, innovativeness, planning, organization, cooperation, doing, and humanity. Uh, the results achieved through community programs indicated the creation of uh, community resilience. And uh, these are some papers about social capital and libraries that is written by this uh, author. And now my colleague, uh, Randolph, will continue and end this presentation. Yes, all right. Can, can you hear me? I cannot see myself right now, but yeah. So um, with regards to all the theories that uh, Dr. Andreas Varheim mentioned a while ago, um, these are the things that we could reflect on with our case here in the ASEAN region. And um, one of which is the challenges and opportunities that our community should reflect on is um, we divided it into three points. Number one is sustainable indigenous cultural initiative. Um, as we may all know, um, here in the ASEAN region, two thirds of the total population, which includes 661.5 million people in the ASEAN belong to the indigenous community. And one of the challenges in this indigenous community is the non-recognition of cultural rights and heritage, and also the violation of this rights of indigenous women. And with this, uh, probably, and maybe libraries could be a perfect uh, a place, a physical space for these people, for the indigenous communities to thrive and to be protected with their cultural rights through the use of social capital and community resilience. The next one is environment. As we may all know here in the ASEAN region, 
we have a lot of disasters, natural disasters. Um, we are in the Pacific Ring of Fire. There's a lot of earthquakes. Um, there's like three catastrophic disasters that happened in the, the ASEAN region, which includes the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004, which killed over 200,000 people in, in the Indonesian region, in Aceh, in Sumatra. There's also the cyclone Nargis in 2008, which uh, had about over 100,000 fatalities and a lot of families in Myanmar were displaced. And um, probably the Philippines may relate on this, the Typhoon Haiyan in 2013, where a lot of people were displaced and there's over a thousand of fatalities as well. And as a library, um, we are providing information. Uh, we are providing the needs of our community. Probably we could reflect on this, on mitigating environmental degradation and we, we could advocate advocate for environmental advocacy or probably environmental resilience to our community to generate environmental capital. And um, apart from disasters, we have also um, environmental ecosystems such as, you know, the Southeast Asia is home to almost 15% of world's tropical forests. So just imagine, the, the, the challenges that we're facing right now, there's wildlife trafficking, there's um, illegal trade of um, endangered species, there's um, environmental degradation of our forests, and not only forests, but also um, our marine life. So probably we as librarians or public librarians could also enter in this um, situation where we could help and support the government to generate environmental capital. And the last one would be innovation. Um, as you may all know, innovation is really important in the ASEAN region. Um, if we see um, the European Union, um, they have placed a lot of uh, centers, communities, uh, uh, sorry, uh, committees, research and development, innovation industries, creative industries in their platform to provide the EU community a, a place to innovate and be creative. So I believe one of which is libraries. And probably in the ASEAN region, we could be the place for the people of the ASEAN, for the people or the population of the ASEAN could communicate with each other, connect with each other through innovation and creativity. And um, a, there's a lot of programs and implementations in that. Uh, probably you've heard about maker spaces, innovation hubs, creative hubs that is being implemented by, by public libraries, academic libraries, and school libraries. And probably this could be a way for us to help and support the ASEAN community and the ASEAN Charter to um, promote innovation and creativity in the region. And uh, next slide, please. Yeah. yeah, so this is the last slide. Um, since we have talked about social capital, environmental capital, and also we need to generate public trust within our community, because if there's no trust, then no one will support our programs. No one will advocate our programs in the libraries. So we have to use the existing networks and the emerging networks, the existing communities and the existing centers to generate this social capital. And one of which that I, 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 we would see here in the ASEAN community is the existing professional organizations, such as the Congress of um, Southeast Asian Nation that was established in 1970. And this um, sole organization that promotes library and information practices and library information science issues that we are facing in the ASEAN region could be a way for us to talk about things uh, such as challenges and opportunities to help the ASEAN community. The next one is the ASEAN University Network, which is one of the famous network in the academic libraries in the ASEAN region. And um, it helps to create information sharing. It helps to create and collaborate with each other to help academic libraries to share information with one another. 
And apart from library programs, they also have exchange programs that help libraries and scholars in the ASEAN region to connect and share their research and information within the community. And the C, D, and E, they are external professional organizations that are um, established by IFLA and, and the Special Libraries Association. And also the library schools associations, the ALIAP, they have this um, annual conferences that talks about how to, you know, improve library schools in, in, you know, in providing information to the community. And at the F and G, um, it's already existing right now. Um, as we may all know, the, the president right now of the Aplin is um, one Masli, one Razali. Um, he is advocating on this part to provide network to all the public libraries here in the ASEAN region to communicate and work together with each other. And the last one is the ASEAN Cultural Center, which is in Thailand right now that, you know, it is the headquarters for the cultural center that promotes the cultural heritage of the ASEAN region. And I hope this ASEAN Cultural Center would be able to collaborate with public libraries in the ASEAN region to be the hubs to promote cultural heritage and rights of the indigenous communities and promote environmental um, advocacies and innovation advocacies as well. So to, to conclude on my part, um, uh, the, the, the gist of this presentation is we should work together as one and enable to us to work together and to achieve this strong communities. We have to help as librarians, the ASEAN community to generate social capital, which may lead to trust and cooperation by which we can be uh, working as one here in the ASEAN region. I think that's it in my part. Do you have any last remarks, Dr. Andreas? Or yeah, I think you're you're muted, right? Now. I think we'll leave it at that, and also uh, thank the the audience for their patience. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Varheim and Randolph. This is a wonderful presentation about social capital, and I truly believe that you know public libraries is an excellent generator of social capital. And uh, all right, thank you once again. And now let us proceed to plenary session four on collaborating through crisis. What libraries have to teach us about surviving a plague? Our speaker is an associate professor critical pedagogy librarian, the Graduate Center, City University of New York. Everyone, let us all welcome, and it's nice to see you again, Ms. Emily Jabinski. Hi, Raya, thank you so much. Am I, can you see my video? Uh, not yet. Okay. Maybe there. Okay. We'll wait for it. Oh, there I am, hi. Yes, hi, Emily. Nice to see you again. Hi, so nice to see you. I wish we were in Kazan City together, but that's right. And will, you will eat your ilocos empanada. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. All right. Let me just pull up my PowerPoint, and we'll go from here. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm almost there. Thank you for your patience. Okay. Right. Okay. Here we are. Thank you so much, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to share my thoughts with you today. Um, I'm going to read from the paper that is in my uh, that I submitted, and I hope you'll all have a chance to read it uh, after the event. Uh, so, as I completed, I'm getting some feedback. I'm getting okay. There we go. All right. Thank you. So as I completed this paper late on deadline, and I apologize to the conference organizers for that, I was typing from the Graduate Center at the City University of New York in New York City. The air conditioning is working. I'm glad for that, especially as climate change accelerates, heating the planet, including my neighborhood, to record high temperatures and Manila style humidity. I am doing here what many of you are also likely doing, figuring out how to return to some semblance of normal given the closures we have all faced since March 2020. 
My challenge right now is to find a way to make the space work for patrons who want to return to the building to explore our print collections, to sit and read and write away from the challenges of home. Over the 20 years I have worked in this field, the space has always been central to the library experience. Even as those of us with ready access to the internet do more and more of our work online, my job has always happened in person. Working with the community at the reference desk, in classrooms, in my office when I've been lucky to have one. And that work has included helping, helping patrons navigate library space. For every question I get about where to find a book, I'll get five or six asking where the comfort room is or how late the building is open. The library is a space that matters. The library is also an online entity linked to the community through phone, email, and online chat reference, digital collections, remote workshops, and events. That's my slides. Oh, so here's the library. Here's a picture of where I work every day, the Graduate Center in Manhattan. The library is also an online entity linked to the community through phone, email, and online chat reference, digital collections, remote workshops, and events. Think of the digital networks necessary to do that work from undersea cables and satellites that provide internet service to the ways libraries use that access to connect with each other. We spend so much of our time connecting with each other, hence this conference. No matter where your library is located or what type of library it is, we all face similar challenges. How can we work with limited budgets to acquire and circulate materials needed by our communities? What kinds of technologies should we provide to our patrons? and how can we best train them in their use? That's my cap. How do we understand what kinds of information resources our patrons need from the library? And how do we best connect people to those resources once we collect them? How do we restore and maintain public trust in reliable information related to science, government, and public health? And how do we collaborate together to share the work of cataloging and classifying our collections and to share our collections themselves through interlibrary loan, document delivery, and other network systems. Even as I plan for a return to physical access to the library, I rely on those networks to improve my library, its resources, and our services. At the Graduate Center, we talk a lot about our library as a node on a network rather than just a singular library, and I think it's useful for all of us to think about that the way that works. So this is an image of the flight plans that <laughs> I had hoped to join uh, this event when it was first uh, uh, scheduled prior to the pandemic. And these are the networks that we've seen uh, go down since COVID hit. And this is where I was hoping to be at the National Library of the Philippines. We talk a lot in libraries about the ways we are interconnected and interrelated. Think about cataloging standards, for example. These are what Susan Lee Starr, who, whose work I really appreciate and um, I'm happy to share uh, a link to my favorite paper of hers if, you, if you're interested in the chat. These are what Susan Lee Starr calls information infrastructures, systems that are embedded in the daily life of knowledge workers like us. When we all agree to use a given system, we can obtain efficiencies and establish connections with each other. From my desk in New York City, I can search the holdings of the University of the Philippines collections and even request materials from Quezon City using our resource sharing technologies. I'm currently trying to accumulate all the work I can by Gabriel Bernardo, and I, it's been crucial, my uh, connections to the Philippines to develop that set of documents for my own research. We are each a part of, our, of each other. Our work subtended by shared systems worthy of study and analysis, the boring things that Starr writes about. And we also need to take seriously the ways these systems embed racism, sexism, and imperialism into our libraries and more about what kinds of collaborations they facilitate. I think the harm these systems can do is inextricable from what good they enable, something I explore in this paper. In the context of a global pandemic that has radically transformed both our individual libraries and the networks we rely on, it is also useful to spend time thinking about what our structures of interdependence might teach the world about how best to share. Our task must also always be to understand how that sharing can be more equitable and just. 
Back in the time before COVID-19, I was excited to participate as a speaker at the first ASEAN Regional Conference of Public Librarians to be held at the National Library of the Philippines just steps from Manila Bay. Having spent some time in Metro Manila as a tourist and as a librarian, the opportunity to learn about librarianship in the archipelago and beyond, and to share my thoughts from the United States was matched in excitement only by what I'm sure would have been the robust merienda that are unmatched in the U.S. But then COVID-19 hit the globe and everything we all thought would be, we would be doing never happened. I was actually visiting UP Diliman when virus numbers began climbing, rushing back to New York City as national borders began closing. My library building closed just a week after I returned and I have largely lived and worked from my bedroom since then. The digital network became all we had to work with. The pandemic short-circuited the physical networks all of us relied on for movement between places and people. Suddenly our lives became in some ways quite small, consumed mostly by what this virus was doing to us and to our families, what it would mean to, for our own survival and for the survival of our libraries, our patrons, our communities, and our networks. How would we sustain connections if we could no longer travel to be together in person, not just around the world, but even around the block? How would we share our ideas and challenges with each other? How would we build a shared analysis of what was happening to us if we could not see each other at all? And how could we keep ideas and information circulating when the act of sharing itself had become dangerous and even deadly? These were the concerns I faced in my own library as the pandemic continues to drag on, as variants spread and threaten what progress we've made across the globe, as vaccines are hoarded by the United States and other global North countries, I find myself thinking about big existential questions. Will libraries and librarians be felled by the virus forever? Or will we find ways to continue working together, even in the face of quarantine and isolation? The answers to these questions, answers each of us are discovering day by day, sharing it with each other in the ways that we can, can usefully inform parts of our world that are less used to collaborating than we are. It turns out that digital networks have, have made possible for us to stay connected to one another. As much as I would have loved to wake up one morning in New York and wake up the next in Manila, it turns out that technology has advanced to such a degree that we can often stay connected on email and over video in ways that approximate, if not quite, the ways we would connect if we could see each other in person. The caveat here is that time zones are still real. I don't always want to connect in the wee hours of the morning and I'll be going to bed after I talk here because it's quite late. There are definitely fewer snacks, but we can still communicate and collaborate. And I think the even bigger caveat here is that relies on ac ready access to broadband internet, which is uh, something that I have access to here in, the, in New York City in my Brooklyn apartment, but I understand is not distributed equitably across the United States and certainly not across the globe. But even though we can't fly to see each other, our ideas can still take flight largely thanks to the infrastructure that sits underneath every email we send and every video call we make. Collaboration is still possible at a distance. Our connections to each other are facilitated by and strengthened through existing library infrastructures, like knowledge organization systems and shared cataloging utilities. These may be less material than the wires and satellites that produce the internet, but they are no less consequential for being in some ways abstract. These infrastructures sit at the heart of the library, tools and techniques that make our broad collaborations with each other more possible. When I think about the power of structures in libraries, I always begin with library classification and cataloging systems. Oh, this is the dreaded. Oh, I find that I'm, I backed up on my slides. I'm sorry, it's really quite late. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if underwater cables make video calls and online chat, re chat reference possible, Library of Congress classification and the Dewey Decimal System are an analog in libraries. These are the structures that make it possible to locate books on shelves or inside of catalogs, determining where both where materials sit on the shelves, as well as the controlled terms we use to describe them. Without these tools, we'd only have piles of books. Want a particular book? Without our knowledge organization structures, each individual patron would have to pick through the stack to find the book they needed. 
and that library magic of finding one book on a topic and then finding other, many others like it on the shelf around it, we couldn't do that either. Our systems make the sharing of knowledge possible by contributing ordering principles to the storage and circulation of materials. These structures reflect a certain way of seeing the world, driving our work together in a given direction. In some of my work, I'm exploring the ways that these systems fix in place some ways of understanding the world and not others. The Library of Congress classification is one of these systems, and this is a section that I pulled out for the purpose of this talk. A scholar, Melissa Adler, has documented the system was built initially by Thomas Jefferson to organize his own personal library. After the first legislative library in the U.S. was burned in the War of 1812, Jefferson sold his vast collection to the nation, establishing the first Library of Congress. His organizing scheme came with those materials, reflecting a view of knowledge and the world that put the United States at the center. As the materials entered the library, they continued to be organized into these same categories in the libraries that use Library of Congress, reproducing a Jeffersonian vision of the world even into the present. When the system is exported to other contexts, to another context like the Philippines or other libraries around the world, it carries with it that US-centric perspective. So this is an example from Class D in the LC system. Class D is world history and history of Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera. The history of Asia is confined to DS, a section of the classification that must encompass histories from Iraq to Armenia, Japan to Sri Lanka, the Philippines to Bangladesh. Asia represents 40% of the Earth's land mass and 60% of the world's population, a vast physical landscape with long and contested histories, surely larger than Germany, which gets DD all to itself, or Spain and Portugal, which claim DP in the classification. The intellectual infrastructure here is telling us something about what matters to the United States fine-grained distinctions between European countries, while Asia can be lumped together as one. Given the vast diversity of this region, this makes very little sense. This critique is not to say that these organizing schemes are not essential. They are. Our intellectual infrastructure, our cataloging and classification schemes are necessary. Remember this pile of books? They're also one of the clearest and most comprehensive ways that libraries collaborate with each other. When we all share our metadata with each other, we distribute the labor of original cataloging across libraries. When we use standard vocabularies, we can retrieve all relevant items organized under a single subject heading, even when we're accessing libraries far from home. Our internet connections are crucial infrastructure for collaboration. And so are the intellectual tools we develop that produce the information and action that runs through those wires. For those patrons for whom access to text can happen electronically, that infrastructure has made ongoing research and reading possible, even as our buildings have been closed. My argument isn't that cl the classification scheme should not be used, but that we should be mindful of what it privileges and what it doesn't, whose view of the world is built and maintained by the system and whose is excluded, whose must be built up alongside the dominant more normative scheme as an alternative. If COVID has meant a rethinking of our global interdependence, none of us will be flying those air routes again until vaccines and other public health interventions are equitably distributed to everyone. It also reminds us that the collaborative infrastructures of libraries are crucial to the kinds of sharing librarians do with and for each other. As we look to, toward a future where we can return to public life, paying attention to both what these systems make possible and what they don't will be important. Libraries have continued to share with each other, electronic books to best practices, even as the pandemic has cut us off from our physical connections. Collaboration is at the heart of what libraries do, and the closing of borders can't prevent us from doing what we do best. As the world emerges and fits and starts from the disaster of the last year and a half, let's take the time to look at what infrastructures enabled us to, to continue to work together. An accounting of technology will be essential, who had it and who did not. But our existing intellectual and practical library tools should be accounted for too. How we share the burden of resource description is one crucial way that our field has made 
knowledge accessible to communities across the planet and across time. Let's celebrate what we gain when we work together. At the same time, the ways that these systems institutionalize inequality and exclusion must be reckoned with. Since the world shut down, we've learned a lot about how interdependent we are. When it comes to the virus, none of us is safe until all of us is safe, something we all know acutely as pockets of disease surge and retreat. This is true for so much else too. After all, the broadband I rely on in order to appear via video halfway around the world is a luxury confined to those of us with disproportionate access to wealth and opportunity. Librarians in parts of New York, the state where I live, could not attend a talk like this one. Infrastructure is distributed inequitably. Librarians can tell the world something about that too, especially those of us who have long been forced to rely on knowledge organization structures that represent a view of the world that can be violent, racist, and xenophobic. We can do better in libraries and in the world, and it is up to us to take what we know and to share it with everyone else. Those are the thoughts I had to share with you all today. Uh, Salamat po, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much, Emily. Okay, you will still be joining us for the open forum later? Yes. Yes, okay, thank you once again, Emily. That's what, that was a wonderful presentation, and I, I read somewhere here in the comments section when you mentioned about the robust merienda. Yes. <laughs> okay. And now um, let us proceed to plenary session five, best practices of libraries in ASEAN, a showcase of inspiring examples. John Heacock, a library faculty and the international outreach librarian at California State University, Fullerton. In this position since 1997, he provides library outreach and instruction to his campus international students. John has his MLIS degree from the University of California, Los Angeles, and a TESOL master's degree from California State University, Los Angeles. Because of the diverse cultural populations in California, John's research area is cross-cultural comparisons of library services between countries. John has presented on this topic at library conferences in both the U.S. and Asia. He has written book chapters, journal articles, and a 2019 book. He was the American Library Association's 2016 International Relations Roundtable Chair and was a 2016 Fulbright Scholar teaching LIS in the Philippines, specifically in University of Santo Tomas and Philippine Normal University. Ladies and gentlemen, John Heacock. Hello, hello. Magandang umaga to all of you. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much. Glad to be here. I'm uh, going to go ahead and do a share screen now so I can show you my slides. So here we go. Share screen. I will open that up and let's do from the beginning. Okay, uh, my uh, moderators, can you please confirm uh, that you can see the full screen of my slide? Yes, I can see it. Great. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Thank you very much. Okay, everybody. So wonderful. I'm so glad to be here. Let me just tell you who I am. I'm no stranger to the Philippines. I've been to the Philippines many times and I love the Philippines. Philippine libraries are the best. I am from California State University uh, in Fullerton. That's in California near uh, Los Angeles. I am the uh, library, I'm library faculty at my library, I teach, and I'm the international outreach librarian. So I teach students from Philippines, Vietnam, Taiwan, Korea, China, Europe, all over. I also do international librarian training uh, to all of our partner universities overseas. Uh, this is a picture of me in Malaysia. Uh, and I was the previous chair of the ALA International Relations. So International librarianship is definitely a passion of mine. And I'm so happy to say I had the wonderful opportunity to live in the Philippines for a half year and teach at UST and PNU for Library and Information Science. So any of my uh, former students out there, hello, hello, hello. Good to see you all. Um, that was a wonderful experience. So for 15 years, I've been documenting all of the best practices 
of uh, libraries throughout Asia. These are pictures of all the many different wonderful librarians. And you can see right down here in the lower right corner, some wonderful librarians. There's still some of the top leaders in the Philippines today. There's Miss Lourdes David, uh, there's Miss Sally Arlante, there's uh, Miss Rebecca Jackson, there's uh, Miss um, Teresita Calma. Wow, what great, great librarians I've had the pleasure of working with all the many years that I've been coming to the Philippines. Um, and yes, as, as she mentioned, I mentioned. I published a book last year on uh, serving library users from Asia. So all of this uh, trips that I've been making to Asia have given me a really good perspective uh, to share with you today. So that's what I'm going to share. I'm going to share with you some of the best practices, really good examples I've seen in libraries in all ASEAN public libraries. Now, I want to have a disclaimer. The purpose of my sharing today is not a comparison. Like, oh, who's better? Who, which country is better? No, 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 no. Uh, rather, it's to draw inspiration from others' practices, big or small, rich or poor. I, I go and see libraries that uh, is a very, very small, struggling school library in a province of a developing country. And to me, I'm almost more inspired than that, than a big, huge, massive, um, rich, rich, rich um, uh, library. So this is not a comparison. It's just to draw inspiration from whatever examples I might share with you today. So I'm going to go country by country, and I'm going to give you some really good examples. So we'll start with Brunei. The best practice I want to share with you is some of the proactive service Brunei has done. The Bandar Seri Begawan Library is the main public library in uh, Brunei. And it's a they have wonderful, spacious, high-tech facilities in their library. And there's nine total branches of the public library system in Brunei. Um, all of these are administered under the DBP um, administrative uh, government uh, body that oversees the public libraries. And the, the, they've been extremely active in uh, Brunei and been praised in the media. Media, here's a story from the Borneo Bolton newspaper saying uh, how much they're doing on reopening uh, or trying to in light of the pandemic. And then here's them having a book fair that they, they recently had every year. So um, they're best practices, their continued work that they do. Cambodia, the best practice that I want to highlight with Cambodia is perseverance. It's a different situation in Cambodia. Cambodia currently has no public library network. So there is no national uh, uh, network of libraries throughout the country, like in um, some other countries. However, the perseverance of Cambodian library advocates is really impressive, inspiring. It's beginning to show results. Now, one advocate is the National Library of Cambodia. Now, its reach, what it can uh, accomplish is limited because of little funding, it has very limited funding. Um, so, but it is doing some efforts in outreaching, it's doing book lending, it's uh, acting like a public library in uh, doing reading and promotion events, book fairs. Um, so good, good for them. Uh, that's a, a big, big first step. Uh, another uh, advocate is the Cambodian Library Association. Again, perseverance. It's a very small association compared to PLY or ALA or other large um, um, library associations, but their perseverance and their dedication is very heartfelt. Um, we also have some NGOs that are also very helpful. Uh, they, that's another advocate. Many NGOs in Cambodia are helping with literacy and book promotion. One of them, for example, is called SIPAR, uh, a French NGO, non-government organization. Since 1992, SIPAR has helped create um, hundreds of school libraries and uh, help train volunteers 
and even distributed over 2 million books. Uh, there you can see some of the books written in Khmer, the Cam Cambodian language, <clears throat> distributed to rural areas and school libraries. So finally, progress is coming to Cambodia, although slow. I'm happy to announce that in 2017 and 2018, two provincial libraries in two provinces were constructed. These are photos of the two libraries, um, which is big, big news because none of the provinces for the last decades have had any public library. So this is exciting for Cambodia. Indonesia. Okay, what's a best practice? Uh, best practice that I want to say for Indonesia is rapid modernization. Indonesia has been very uh, aggressive. They have a new, brand new national library building that is spectacular. It's a multi-story. You can see the photo there on the right, a 24-story skyscraper uh, scraper here that was just recently built um, in 2019, 18, I think. Let's continue on and show you some more. Uh, this was their old National Library. Yes, it was 2017 that the new one was built, and then now the new one. But the inside the new National Library building, it's super high tech. They have all kinds of new technological advances. Uh, they have uh, innovations of a robotic transport, book transport, smart lockers, RFID tags, Wi-Fi throughout all the building, every um, on and on and on. So this is really rapid modernization uh, on Indonesia's part. But it's not just the physical building, it's also um, the e-resources. Uh, all of the e-resources are on the National Library's webpage, and there's a lot of them. They have really gone... Um, full steam uh, with multiple sources and multiple key resources. Let's go on to Laos. Laos, the best practice that I'd like to point out for our neighbor Laos is rural outreach. They have really done well on this. So the Nat for decades, the National Library of Laos, uh, plus lots of NGOs have been active in rural outreach. These are book boxes. This is one of the things that Laos has done really well and effectively is uh, stacking books in mobile wooden book boxes and then delivering them to the rural areas throughout the Lao provinces. Lots of NGOs have helped with um, this project in donating time, money, and uh, to the books and the book library development. Delivering the mobile libraries all over, even by boat. Uh, they deliver by boat, by book buses, by motorcycles, uh, all kinds. Malaysia. Well, the best practice for Malaysia is nationwide e-resource access. This is something I'd like to spotlight that Malaysia is doing extremely well. Um, the National Library of Malaysia has been a champion of providing and promoting access to e-resources to the whole country nationwide. And they bring it directly to citizens in their homes through their e-portal, their library portal. It's called Upustaka, which is their e-resource portal. This portal is amazing with all kinds of e-resources, not just, you know, e-books only. Oh, no, no, so much more. E-resources, e-books, e-articles, e-magazines, e-newspapers, e-books, e-videos, all kinds of things. Here, uh, for example, at their... Um, there are online databases. You can choose magazines, e-news, e-newspapers, e-books, all kinds of choices that Malaysia is providing their citizens. Uh, it, there, the Upusaka, the uh, library portal, has been described as putting a library in every home of Malaysia. And the portal not only is just um, books and videos and um, magazines, but also content from the National Library. Uh, they provide some fun things, like the National Library has made craft-making videos for kids and then uploaded that to the Upustaka, the portal. Let's go on to Myanmar. Myanmar uh, is uh, our neighbor there to the east. And the best practice I want to highlight and share with you about Myanmar is group effort, team or group effort assistance. 
Well, Myanmar has challenges. Myanmar has, has tens of thousands of community libraries, but almost all of them are not fully developed full-scale libraries. They're small, they're in rural or small areas or villages, and they're just small collections of some reading materials, um, most of them. Um, in 2014, the Asia Foundation did a comprehensive study of uh, public libraries throughout Myanmar and found a long list of needs. You know, the, the facilities need more, there's, they need more materials, electricity, internet, <clears throat> on and on and on and on. So the best practice I'm featuring here for Myanmar is the group effort. In other words, not just relying on one member. If you had a, a tricycle, for example, and you only had one or two wheels, that tricycle is not going to um, be very effective. So we have a NGOs plus the Myanmar Library Association plus the government all contributing to help the, the uh, library situation in Myanmar. Um, so for example, one of the leading NGOs in Myanmar is the Myanmar Book Aid and Preservation Foundation, the MBAPF. This is a fantastic um, non-government non organization doing so much, and they partner with so many outside partners to help with funding and projects. For example, they uh, recently did a big project with some partners to to provide and bring in three-wheel motorcycle mobile libraries to zip around for community libraries. Great, that's awesome. That's the kind of partnering that the MBAPF has been doing. The, the other partner, Myanmar Library Association, has also been doing things. Uh, they don't have a big budget, but they do have a lot of expertise up here, experts. So. Uh, they've been doing training. For example, last year in 2019, they did digital, digital literacy training uh, sessions in throughout the country. And of course, Myanmar's government is helping in certain ways too, uh, usually with funding. So the Myanmar government just recently completed the renovation of the, its second national library. So they have their main national library in the capital of Myanmar, but then also in Yangon, which, is, which because it's such a large city, is a second um, uh, national library as well. And so there's a picture of it just recently completed. Philippines! Yay, Philippines! Well, the best uh, practice that I'm going to highlight for you today about the Philippines is outreach. Nobody uh, has seen more uh, amazing examples of outreach than me in visiting libraries all over the Philippines that I've traveled. So there's so many examples of public libraries throughout the Philippines with terrific outreach. There, there's absolutely not enough time for me to highlight all of them. We would be here for 10 hours if I could talk and show you all the wonderful public libraries that I've seen and visited. I do wanna give a shout out to the National Library of the Philippines for all the outstanding outreach that they do nationally from going and doing their storytelling times to the uh, literacy advocacy, to book promotion, to on and on and on. Now, again, as I said, I don't have time to highlight all the wonderful public libraries, but if I was gonna mention, if I was gonna just use one as a illustrative example of all of you, then here's an example. Quezon City. The Quezon City Public Library is a, is a good example of um, representative of all of the wonderful uh, public libraries that I visited in the Philippines. With the, and they excel at multiple outreach services. So for example, the Quezon City does their wonderful puppet show literacy outreach. They do their reading promotion outreach, all the dance videos and the and getting out involved in the in the barangays and in the neighborhoods. Um, the General Basa. <laughs> this is their uh, superhero General Basa reading promotion outreach. You know, I was so um, charmed and amazed by General Basa that I actually brought him to the United States to the American Library Association conference. Um, and he charmed and uh, wowed all of the American librarians with his superpowers. <laughs> 
Of course, uh, I'm referring to Troy Laksamana at um, Quezon Public Library, Quezon City Public Library, who is uh, General Basa. Um, also, the Aklatang Gala, the neighborhood reading outreach that they've done, and the neighborhood library day parades that they've done through their city, and on and on. So, uh, Philippine public libraries, amazing. Singapore. Well, we can definitely give a best practice for Singapore. I'm going to uh, showcase their combining technology and targeted user needs. Here's what I mean. For example, let's say you have a targeted group, business professionals. The public libraries in Singapore target them by providing nationwide e-newspaper and e-journal business resource access. How about a target group of seniors, senior citizens? Absolutely. The Singapore Public Libraries target seniors with a senior e-magazine from the library, with senior reading recommendations, senior events at libraries, senior health checkups, all kinds of things for senior citizens. How about a target group of children? Absolutely. The, the public libraries in Singapore under the NLB, um, National Library Board of Singapore, uh, creates wonderful activity videos. This is original content by librarians based on books. So these are librarians uh, highlighting books and making craft or uh, activity videos based on those books. Very cool. And how about a target group of college age students or the workforce? Right. The public libraries in Singapore have targeted that group with over 16,000 e-learning videos in partnership with LinkedIn. So this is a, a, an amazing thing that the public library system is doing in Singapore. And what about, uh, finally, the target of language-specific readers? You know, Singapore is multicultural. They've got Chinese-speaking Singaporeans, uh, Tamil-speaking Singaporeans, Malay-speaking Singaporeans. Right. So the public library uh, system in uh, Singapore has language-specific e-materials in Chinese, English, Tamil, Malay, and other languages. So bravo to Singapore. Thailand, the best practice that I'd like to point out with Thailand is they're adapting to conditions. So what do I mean by that? Well, one way that Thailand adapts, the libraries adapt, is they've created cyber center public libraries. Cyber centers attract more youth visitors. These cyber centers are called TK Park libraries, and they have many of them built throughout Thailand. This is an example. Wow. Now, I know it looks like it's a gaming arcade, right? A video gaming arcade. Well, yes, they do have lots of computers and multimedia, but they are still very much libraries, and they expose all the users to a very appealing collection of books, print, Books, print magazines, print um, journals, lots of things. Um, but their e-resource collection that they have at the TK Park is robust. Thousands of appealing e-books and much more. <laughs> they even have interiors that are very innovative. This is the honeycomb seating area uh, to help perfect for encouraging young readers to um, explore reading. Another example of uh, Thailand adapting is repurposing an old building. So the, the problem was before 2017, Bangkok had no large central public library. It only had the national library and some smaller neighborhood libraries. It's similar to the situation with Manila today. So in the problem was they um, uh, didn't, have space, finding space in Bangkok's crowded city center. Finally, in 2017, the solution. They adapted an old colonial office building into the new Central Public Library. And now it paid off. This new Central Bangkok City Public Library is beautiful. The interior is amazing. It's historic yet modern. They have amazing facilities inside, showcasing new books on this uh, these book racks, and with uh, stacks that are comfortable but modern, and even 
children's areas with a fun, comfortable seating for, to promote reading. So bravo, Thailand. Timur Lesti, it's, uh, one, uh, one of the, uh, the 11th member of uh, Southeast Asia, is uh, small and new, but they also have a best practice that I want to mention. Their best practice is step-by-step goals. Like Cambodia, that perseverance of taking step by step. Now, look, a well stocked public library in a still developing area, that doesn't happen overnight. It often takes step by step goals. And that was, is the case with Timur Leste. Tim, prior to 2000, there was no public library in Timur Leste, not in Dili, its capital, or elsewhere. But library advocates, step-by-step, worked tirelessly on goals, including networking with important advocates. So they networked and met with the then, at that time, the first lady, the presidential first lady, um, Kirsty Sword Gusmeo. They worked with her, and step-by-step, they paid off. In 2000, finally, finally, the country had its first public library. And she was there, the first lady, to open it. And it was named after the first president of uh, Timur Lusty, the Gusmail Reading Room. So this is a photo of their first and only new public library in Timur Lusty. Now, it's small inside. They they started off with only 4,000 books, um, but they have internet. They now have multimedia. And most important of all, they have a website, they have a Facebook page, they're, they're connecting into social media, and most importantly, they continue that step-by-step development by partnering, by networking with partners, both in and out of Timur Leste, for donations and, and assistance and partnering. So bravo, Timur Leste. Finally, Vietnam. The best practice that I'd like to showcase with Vietnam is Partnership building. Yes, the the main public library in Ho Chi Minh City, that's in the south of Vietnam, is the General Sciences Public Library. That's the main branch, the main central public library in Ho Chi Minh City. Now, they have a children's library in that uh, main public library. Um, And I've been there. This is me visiting it. I've been there many times over the years. For 15 years, I've been going to Vietnam um, and the, the library was nice. It was a nice, but it was simple, a simple room without a lot of modernizations. Well, through dedicated discussions and networking, library officials obtained, finally obtained modernization funding through a grant with the Samsung Corporation. And now, wow, look at what happened. It really paid off. The new children's library within the library is amazing. It's got a beautiful new furniture, lots of new books, fantastic facilities, and even a starry, starry night planetarium. Look at the stars on the ceiling uh, device from Samsung. Wow, wow, wow. This is great to teach STEM uh, for all of the up and coming children for science and technology and engineering and math. So this is a a great example of partnering from Vietnam. So in summary, everyone, this is an inspiring showcase of library best practices from all over Southeast Asia. And may we emulate these examples in our libraries, no matter our budget, no matter our circumstance, do step-by-step patient endurance on whatever we can do whatever little changes we can make in our innovations. Thank you so much. Salamat po. Maraming salamat din po, wow. John Hickok. Thank you so much. Uh, I think our participants, they're having a great time watching your presentation because it seems like they have a Southeast Asian virtual tour of the <laughs> libraries. So yes. thank you so much. I just saw their messages in our chat box. Also, thank you to all our wonderful plenary speakers. But before we have our open forum... May I remind once again our participants to key in your questions in the chat box and comment section using the format name of the speaker dash and then your question. 
Okay, these questions will be consolidated later during our open forum. You can also use the raise hand button functionality of Zoom if you want to ask questions and we will acknowledge you accordingly. So before our open forum, we will have a presentation from one of our gold sponsors, Live Tech Source Philippines Incorporated. Let's watch their video. Um, there's no sound. To our tech team, there's no sound. Sure, I can hear it. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much to our gold sponsor, Live Tech Source Philippines. So at this point, let's have our open forum for this plenary session. May I call on again our speakers? So we have Randolph Man Mariano, okay, uh, Emily Drabinsky, and John Heacock. Okay, so we have a few questions now. I know we're running a bit late, but it's okay. We still have uh, some time for a few questions. Our first question is for Randolph Mariano. I understand that Dr. Varheim already has a class. <laughs> so random here is joining us. Yeah. Okay, Randolph, um, you were talking about social capital. Okay, there's a tricycle passing by. <laughs> okay, um, Randolph, you were men you mentioned something about social capital. Can you identify like concrete examples, concrete examples on how public libraries can create social capital? Yeah. So, um, as uh, Dr. Andreas Varheim mentioned a while ago, you could create social capital by creating public trust. So public trust is very organic. It doesn't really exist in the library itself. It exists with external factors as well. There's internal and external factors. The government agencies, the trust of the citizens to the government, the trust of the citizens to the local uh, officials, the trust of the citizens to the public libraries itself. So it's, it, it's a, a collaborative trust that, uh, that the, the libraries may help to generate social capital. And one concrete example is that in the, uh, that um, Andreas mentioned a while ago is the Japan um, case where after the, the, the post-disaster, uh, post-math, the aftermath of the disaster, um, the citizens trusted the, the protocols of the, the, the Japanese government and the institutions. And they, they, they trusted that the libraries will help them to support what they need, information needs during the time of the, 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 the aftermath of the disaster. So those are the uh, simple examples of that. Mm. Okay. But it's a bit theoretical sometimes. So Yes, it's a bit. Yes. So I think our participants would like to know like bite-sized digestible examples of how social yeah. capital can be gained in public libraries. But yes, uh, we need to gain public trust first before we can generate social capital. Therefore, yeah. we need to conduct activities towards the achievement of this public trust. 
by the people to our public library. So, okay, thank you so much, Randolph. And then we have here a question for Emily. Um, yes, Emily, uh, I'm not sure about this, but the question is, do you think there should be a dedicated schedule in LC for what we are experiencing right now, the pandemic? No, I know oh. that... Um, in LCR is medicine, right? So uh, yeah. maybe it can be under R. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's a good question, though, right? Because yeah. the yeah. the pandemic has just um, changed so many of the ways we think the world is going to work. Right. So the new forms of knowledge. What? How will we organize them? I think mm -hmm. it's a it's a good question. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I interrupted you though, Rhea. Were you yeah. finished? Yeah, it's okay. Actually, that that is the question. Do you think we need to have a dedicated schedule in LC for what we are experiencing right now? So the answer it feels, is... <laughs> it feels world changing. It feels like everything is different and also the same. But what is the... How, how would the, the lockdowns we've all experienced, the lockdowns that you're experiencing in the Philippines, it's like, is there is there any language in the controlled terms to capture that? I don't know. Um, yes, so it's a good idea. Yeah, mm, it's a good idea. It's it brought so many changes in how we do things during the pandemic. You know, so oh yeah, probably probably that's a good idea. And how can they <laughs> probably how can they submit a new schedule <laughs> for the Library of Congress? They have to email them. <laughs> there's a whole system, and there's a process <laughs> that you go through where you submit your your changes. You have to be a special library to be able mm. to do it. It's, it's complicated, but if, if anyone's actually interested, I'll put my um, email in the chat and you can get in touch. We can talk about it. All right. Thank you. That would be great. So to our participants who would like to propose a new LC schedule, you know, there's a system that you have to follow. And Emily will be putting her email address later so you can contact her also and tell you what to do. Okay. Um, now a question for John. John, there are actually two questions. Uh, were you able to identify because the things that you presented a while ago were the activities like the programs and advocacies of the different libraries in Southeast Asia that happened before the pandemic. So right now, during the pandemic, were you able to identify best practices in Southeast Asian libraries? Like during uh, the pandemic, mm, yeah, best right. practices. Yeah, you, need, don't need, you don't need to name all but probably right. just some examples of best practices yeah. during the pandemic. It's, it's funny you should mention that because uh, I was uh, doing double duty. Uh, today yeah. I presented with you and this morning I presented to uh, Indonesia on that topic <laughs> okay. on um, best practices during um, pandemic conditions. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of them are the same uh, worldwide of a much better increase in reliance on social media we have to, we as libraries have to get with technology and um, tap into uh, Facebook. If, if your library is not have an active Facebook, Twitter, Instagram um, account, then get on that and start communicating with your members. Also video, today's youth is the Generation Z video generation. They are practically born with a cell phone coming out of their womb <laughs> in their hand. Um, everybody has one. So libraries should be making videos and um, they're so easy to do uh, and put them up on your library's webpage and get a library webpage. Now, look, I, I know for small remote areas with limited budgets, that may seem challenging, but actually YouTube is free. Uploading, making a video with a camera phone, um, uploading it to YouTube is very easy nowadays. Um, doesn't need to be Hollywood filmmakers anymore. Anybody can start making uploaded videos now. So those are lots of the di different technologies that libraries throughout Southeast Asia, as well as in the U.S., have been implementing during this past year of quarantine. Okay, and a follow-up question to that is, what inspired you to work on different libraries across the globe? I think what ah. propelled you to, you know, uh, study the different, the libraries across the globe, especially in Southeast Asia. Uh, and especially in, uh, in the Philippines. Uh, I have to say it's got to be um, Chicken Joy and Jolly Spaghetti. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I love it. Uh, yeah. No, no, but in seriousness, um, the thing that it, uh, brought me to this is California is a very multicultural state. We have 
um, students and um, immigrants that come to California from all over, but especially from Asia. The Filipino American population in California is the largest in the United States. Um, so my university is incredibly diverse. Uh, Emily earlier was talking about uh, diversity and inclusion, and that's a big issue in America right now. Um, so I became so intrigued and so interested in serving all of the wonderful multicultural um, populations from uh, Asia, from Europe, from but mostly from Asia in California. That's why I said, I need to go over to Asia and I need to see libraries straight from it. I don't want to hear it secondhand from somebody else. I need to uh, experience it myself. Okay, thank you so much, John. And um, to our participants, if you still have questions, we can just email your questions to our uh, speakers and they will reply to your questions, okay? So thank you once again to all our plenary speakers. And at this point, we would like to award our certificate of appreciation to all of you. The certificate reads, National Library of the Philippines. Okay, hold on. There's actually thunder outside. <laughs> the National Library of the Philippines in partnership with ASEAN Public Libraries and Information Network and in collaboration with Philippine Librarians Association Incorporated, Librarians Association of Malaysia, and the Asia Foundation present the certificate of appreciation to Randolph Mariano, Andreas Varheim, Emily Drabinsky, and John Heacock for being our resource speakers in the first ASEAN Virtual Regional Conference of Public Librarians with the theme ASEAN Libraries, Arts and Culture, Inspire, Innovate, and Collaborate, held on August 23 to 25, 2021, give us, given this 24th day of August 2021 via Zoom, signed by our uh, director, of NLP, Cesar Gilbert Adriano, and the president of APLIN, Juan Mazli Bin Juan Razali. So to all our plenary speakers, thank you so much. We will be sending you our, your certificate of appreciation. And um, to our participants, that concludes our plenary session this morning. We are on the second day of the first ASEAN Virtual Regional Conference of Public Librarians. So uh, thank you so much to all of you. We will see you all later in the parallel sessions this afternoon. But before that, to our participants, again, please include in your name in the Zoom, uh, like, like for, my, for my case example, put, uh, what's this? Include your name in the rooms of the topics you will be joining in for the parallel session for proper identification. So you can use this format. In my case, 333 three, three, because we have three parallel sessions and I intend to join in all the par in parallel sessions in meeting room number three. Okay, so that's why 333 three, Rea Apolinario dash PH. So please do so, so that our um, organizing committee can help you transfer to one parallel session to another, okay? But uh, don't worry, it's easy because later on, they will put in our chat box uh, the link to the different meeting rooms, okay? Also, before we have our lunch, we will have our raffle, Okay, so may I ask our uh, technical committee to please flash the winners for our raffle. This will still be for validation. Okay, the mechanics of the raffle are the following. Winners will be drawn via electronic raffle. Winners will be validated on the three days attendance from morning to afternoon. That's why it is required that you fill out the attendance sheet daily. So we have one attendance sheet in the morning and one attendance sheet in the afternoon. If winners are not in the three days attendance, their price will be automatically forfeited and the corresponding price will be redrawn again. Okay, so announcement of winners will be during lunch break of the second day, so that's today, and during the closing ceremonies tomorrow. Winners will be notified via their registered email. So claiming of prices will also be sent via the winner's registered email. Okay, um, are we going to flash the winners? So we already have, I think, the winners for today. But then, okay, this will be validated. So you have to be present first. No, You have to be present 
today and tomorrow and also yesterday. So the whole three-day conference. Okay, I'm not sure if we're going to flash it, but uh, yes, there you are. So we have the raffle winners for from Airbooks. You will receive 500 pesos worth of GCash each. Congratulations to Christelle Joy Paite, Aleli S. Polafox. Congratulations. And from CE Logic, you will receive one Tumblr. Congratulations to Janice D. Lopez. And from Odillo, 1,000 worth of Starbucks certificates each. Congratulations to Bienvenido Permalino Onkiko III and Rosel Esparago. Okay, from Life Tech, you will receive Coffee Maker. Congratulations to May wow. Joyce M. Dulnuan. Okay, but please, okay, this needs this need to be validated. So to all our winners, you should be present also tomorrow. Okay, and in the parallel session later. Otherwise, your prize will be forfeited. All right, so congratulations to all our winners. To everyone, enjoy your lunch and see you all again later at 12.45 p.m. for the start of our parallel session. All right. Thank you and see you again. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>